Yeah, I see Mario. Mario, I'm going to do a countdown. Are you ready? He's ready. Five, four, three, two, one, and recording in progress. All right. Welcome everyone to our city council meeting here on January 18th, 2022. How many of you have been writing 2022 on your checks? Or am I the only one who still writes checks? Don't What's answer the check. <laughs> I deserve that. All right, before we get started, I will ask uh, our very cogent city clerk, Clementine, to read to people and share with people how they can participate. They probably know the drill pretty well by now, but let's just go ahead and remind them how to participate in this hybrid meeting, please, Clementine. Yes, thank you. The city of Monterey is committed to the safe attendance of its public meetings. Masks are required for all who attend in person, regardless of vaccination status, except those who are younger than two years old or have a medical condition that prevents wearing a mask. Attendees in the council chamber, please keep phones and devices muted to prevent audio interference. The city of Monterey continues to offer virtual methods for public participation in meetings. There are two ways to virtually participate. You may join the meeting using the Zoom app on your computer or mobile device, and you can also call in to the Zoom meeting. To join the meeting on Zoom on your computer, smartphone, or telephone, use the link or phone number on the agenda at iSearchMonterey.org. To call in by telephone, dial toll-free 833-568-8864, and then enter meeting ID 160-772-9333, pound. And if prompted to enter a participant ID, press pound. Detailed instructions on using Zoom are available at monterey.org slash public meetings. To make a public comment using the Zoom app, you can virtually raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. If you dialed in by phone, raise your hand by dialing star nine and then unmute yourself when called upon by dialing star six. You must do both. Public commenters will be muted until it's their turn to speak. We'll call on each public speaker in the order of their hands raised. Please stay within the time limit, time limit that is established for today's meeting, which we'll show using a countdown timer on the screen. If you're connected live on Zoom, the timer is accurate with no delay. Today's meeting is also streamed live on the city's YouTube account at youtube.com slash city of Monterey with approximately 10 seconds delay and on Comcast channel 25 up to 90 seconds delay. As always, we look forward to receiving your public comment. All right, thank you, so well said. And we'll call our meeting to order. And one more thing, two more things, please, Clementine. Would you introduce our caring city council, please? Certainly, council member Albert. Here. Council member Hoffa. Here. Council member Smith. Here. Council member Williamson. Here. And Mayor Robertson. And I'm here as well. And then uh, Clementine, if we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance, so as soon as you can uh, get a flag on our screen, again, through the magic of the internet, we'll wait a moment. And there it is, right on top of Colton Hall. So please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. To the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Public comments. These are public comments, a maximum of three minutes so on anything within the jurisdiction of the city of Monterey. And we would let you know that if you have to wish to comment on anything on the agenda, you'll have an opportunity to do that. And this evening, we're gonna be looking at the uh, district maps, not this afternoon. And if you want to leave a contact either now or through suggest at monterey.org, our very cognizant staff will respond to you, guaranteed. So with that, do we have any general public comment not on the agenda? Mayor Chief Holber from the council chamber. We have Nina Bita present. And Nina, is that green light turned on there? Uh, there is a green light okay. on. And this is to go to the council. That is okay, thank you. Can you turn on that light? Because I want to put 
Well, now you're asking me to do all kinds of things. I'm not sure. I know if I do. <laughs> First, I want to start off by saying that um, there's going to be a special meeting of the city council and I request that that be held in the chambers. Um, in the past, these have been at the conference center off site, and in the council chambers will be uh, the only place that's uh, recording a visual recording as well as audio recording so for the public's best um, interest and in interest of transparency, please hold them here. You can go ahead. Okay. There's a lot being said about 5G and about the um, the uh, facility that's on the beach right now that the uh, military and uh, Naval Post Graduate School and uh, AT&T built. It's just internet, correct? It's just broadband. What's the problem with this frequency? And I have provided handouts for you um, for a uh, live fire test, AT&T um, live fire test with uh, SpaceX. Um, with the military down in New Mexico um, in 2020. And I've just been able to pull the data together on that. They were very impressed with this live fire drill. Um, the, uh, and it was communication. It was just internet communication between uh, planes and vehicles and command centers. The only problem was as a result of this, fire, this live fire drill, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of birds were killed. Um, scientists were scratching their heads. They could not figure out what was going on. Um, but they said this is a massive death of, of, of bird life. And it happened at the same time that this live fire drill was happening. We have a facility on Monterey Beach that's going to be sim doing similar drills, connecting internet, just internet, with all kinds of facilities. And yet, what are we going to experience here in terms of marine life death and bird life death? The, the information is long standing of what's known. Tomorrow, new 5G frequencies will also be activated, untested, no health parameters at all. And there's no idea how this is gonna affect the public. I'm asking you, these are we're making facilities, but these are also environmentally affecting, health affecting. You have tourists that come into town. This 5G needs to be shut down by the city. The city needs to take act to stop endorsing these facilities and this radiation. It's gonna have catastrophic environmental effects. It already has the uh, screen. Um, again, these birds, these birds that were minding their own business um, that will not be available to be part of our environment anymore because they were killed by the military. This has to be addressed now and the city must take action on this issue of wireless radiation instead of its wholesale adoption and endorsement of this radiation. 5G frequencies particularly impact insects. They absorb it, especially bees. Um, this is something that um, is catastrophic for our food supply. So I'm asking the Monterey City Council to address this issue, to read through this information, and to realize we need to preserve radio frequency radiation for our first responders, for the police and the fire. And the rest of it, we need to scale back drastically and end 5G. And I'm asking for your action on this. And Nina, I, I couldn't get the system to work. Did you want to describe what this is? It's a picture. This is a headline from a newspaper article in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And it shows pictures, there's other pictures of the birds they collected, a few of the birds they collected, and they're sending them to labs to find out what they are. But if a bird has a heart attack or a bird has a stroke from something that no one can see, invisible radiation, how are they gonna draw the connection to it? It's not like a bullet from a gun. Okay, but these birds were killed, and this was from the military live fire drill. 
And that can happen here over and over and over again. Thank you. And Mayor, that's the only speaker I see in the council chambers. And we do have a hand raised on our Zoom uh, part of the meeting. So please go ahead, Ms. Rash. Hi, thank you. It's Jean Rash from uh, Monterey Vista. A couple things. I noticed that there's going to be the um, road repair uh, Casa Verde uh, area, the road. And I hope that that's being coordinated with the Rule 20A funds that were allocated um, a long time ago, but are now imminent um, to that area. I hope there's coordination and that we um, optimize what we can do to make that area safe and beautiful and reduce the fire hazards there. The second one, um, Bill and I have walked down to the Del Monte Beach probably seven times since Thanksgiving. We love that beach, but I'll tell you, it's very difficult to walk through all the homeless encampments. And I can tell you're trying, but you have to try more. You have to break up every encampment at dusk and send everybody on their way with all their belongings. Um, it's against the city ordinances to have camping on the beach. Um, that's been long established. And that's the only way to take care of that beach. Um, the whole thing is heartbreaking. Uh, we don't want our beaches treated this way. We don't want our homeless treated this way. But I'm gonna tell you, we don't want our visitors treated this way. When my adult daughter comes home with our little seven-year-old granddaughter, and she says, Mama, what beach should I go down and walk? If Bill's not with her, do you think I'm sending her down to 13 homeless encampments on Del Monte Beach? No, I'm not. And so all that revenue when she stops for ice cream with the, the granddaughter and when she wants to bring home takeout, bring it back home after they're done walking the beach. No, I'm not going to tell her to go there. I'm going to send her down to Carmel Beach. So all that revenue is lost. The reputation of the beautiful beach is lost. Um, I know there's demands on the community action team, but they're so good with the homeless. They're so good at taking care of the beach. Keep, keep utilizing them. You've got to be habitual about it. You've got to be firm. You've got to do it every evening. Um, and then just a couple seconds, uh, Nina's right. Because we can't get um, the coverage from the, the Monterey Conference Center, which is unfathomable that we can't, um, you really should be having these forums uh, publicized to the public. I can't believe you can't do it from the Conference Center, which I'm sure would be ideal. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. And we did have one other hand raised, which then went down. So I'll just give a moment in case that person unraised their hand by accident. But I think we're probably good. Yep, no more hands raised, Mayor. All right, thanks. In that case, I'll go ahead and close the public comments section of our agenda. And we'll take a look here. Next thing we will look at consent items. Was there anyone in the public who wanted to pull any of the consent items that we know of? No, Mr. Mayor, we're not aware of any one uh, member of the public asking us to pull an item from the consent agenda. All right, uh, council Mayor. members, anyone have questions or want to pull Mayor. something? Are you ready for a motion? Mayor, I'm sorry, Chief Holber from the council chambers. Yes, Chief. Ms. Beatty asked for number eight to be pulled. Thank you. Uh, number eight is, is a public, public hearing. hearing. It's not part of consent. It's not consent. There will be a public hearing on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we'll wait for Ms. Beatty and she can share her remarks at that time. That'll be our next thing. Again, council questions, ready to move, go? Move to approve uh, consent to one through four. Second. Oh, no, one through seven, So One through seven, and Council Member Ed seconded it? Yes. Roll call, please. Council Member Hoffa? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Williamson? Yes. Council Member Albert? Yes. And Mayor Roberson? Yes, for me as well. 
So we will go on to item eight, and that's a public hearing on a substantial amendment to the annual action plan for CDBG funds and to submit it to the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to our collaborative city manager, Hans Unslar, who will make uh, introductions and set the stage for, I'm sure, for one of our cognizant staff members. So it's all yours, Hans. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is a, it's a routine item uh, that is in front of you year after year. Um, this is an item in which we basically share with you uh, how much money we have and how we plan on spending that uh, those funds. Um, our uh, housing uh, manager, Grant Leonard, is online and uh, he will uh, um, introduce the item to you and, and uh, share with you a brief presentation. Okay, welcome, Grant. Thank you, allow me to share my screen. All right, is that being shared? Not yet. Okay. Yep. Okay. There it is. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council and public. Uh, the action before you tonight is a substantial amendment to the 2021-2022 uh, Annual Action Plan for our Community Development Block Grant Program. So a quick review, um, the annual action plan covers the fiscal year from July 1st to uh, 2021 to June 30th, 2022. You approved the action plan in April of 2021, and it acts as our budget for the Community Development Block Grant Program. We have four major project areas. Those include public service grants to our nonprofits that serve the city, Infrastructure improvement grants to parks or to nonprofit facilities, housing preservation programs such as our Mr. Fix It program, and planning and administration. And at the time in April, we estimated our budget to be just over $1.1 million. Why do we need a substantial amendment? A substantial amendment is needed whenever we have a significant change to the action plan such as new regulations from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, if we change allocations between the programs, or if we add a new program. The reason we need a substantial amendment today is that good news, our revenues are up. Uh, we've had additional loan payoffs, so that acts as program income for us. And we also have increased community interest in our home repair program and specifically larger pricier repairs. And so those have traditionally been covered by our major loan program. Uh, however, we did not include the loan program in the annual action plan last April. So in order to fund those loans, as opposed to smaller repair grants, we need to reestablish that program. So today's action is very simple. It is to uh, create the new, or to reinstall the major home repair loan program and to award it a budget of $100,000, which is being funded through our additional revenue from those loan payoffs. And with that, we can take questions and public comments. All right, thank you, Grant. So I, it's probably, uh, I'm guessing the world substantial amendment is probably a little bit of bureaucrat ease in that what you're basically add, adding is $100,000 to home rehabilitation, as I read it. That's exactly right. This okay. is a, uh, a technical term from our friends in Washington. Oh, uh, gotta love them. All right, any council questions before we go to the public? Go side by side gallery. Oh, I don't see any questions, so let's go to the public, please. I, I know we have Miss Beatty at least, uh, very, who would like to speak, so we'll start with her, and then we'll uh, see if anyone online would like to share with us. So my name is Nina Beattie, and I'm just looking at a at an empty uh, council chambers, which is surprising to me. Um, I'm thankful that one 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 of our um, uh, our police representative is here um, to to at least push buttons and and allow me to to present to you tonight. 
I, I don't know the parameters of the HUD block grants, um, but I don't see, uh, is there any provision for those grants to be used in terms of dealing with um, homes, not just home repair, but homes, um, especially to address the homeless situation. I just want to incidentally note that when I spoke with you the last time and mentioned Joy and her situation and uh, Mayor, you said that I would be contacted. I was never contacted by anyone from the city um, to, to address that situation. Um, Esther Malkin's article, I'm sure you saw in the Monterey County Weekly um, that talks about the existing uh, legislation that you talked about um, at a previous meeting, um, as well as the uh, accessory dwelling units have no affordability features. And so with HUD, uh, housing and urban development, um, there needs to be something to be used, this money to be used to, to deal with affordability in the city of Monterey. Because as the previous speaker, um, public speaker on the other topic, homelessness is such a major issue and the city values transients, but only if they have a lot of money in their pocket. Um, this is a situation that none of us would hope to be in. And yet I am surprised that these HUD block grants are not being used, such as what the city of Salinas did, this revolutionary idea of buying a, um, a large hotel and converting it into housing for people that are homeless. Um, on a smaller scale, this is something that could be done here um, to, um, as well as discussed several years ago, um, small apartment buildings to be um, used for transition housing um, so that people can have a place to live, can get back on their feet, can have some place for their mail to come so they can receive checks and they have some permanence to be able to get on with their life. Um, cleaning up beaches, um, is not a solution to the situation. And using the HUD block grants to me seems like um, a, a huge priority to deal with the suffering that's going on um, in, in our community from people that for one reason or another no longer have a roof over their heads. Um, and um, so I'm asking you to allocate monies from these block grants to specifically target this issue of creating affordability features um, for people so that they can stay in their homes, perhaps um, county tax relief or other tax relief um, or, or forgiveness of different debts. This is just something that the city needs to put its head together if they really are serious about homelessness. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beatty and Clementine. Do we have any on, online? Yes, yes, we do. Um, Jean Rash, please unmute and go ahead. Uh, just a follow up to uh, Nina. The, the um, hotel that was revitalized in Salinas by the Shangri-La Corporation, um, I, great, great ideas. All these are great ideas. What concerns me about that is that is a 10 year commitment by Shangri-La to keep it um, in low income housing. And then I think the presumption is they could do what they want. And I would love to know more about that. If we're giving short term, if we're giving all this money to um, the remodeling of these shelters, and then we're going to lose access to them and potentially lose all the investment. I, I would love to know more. I'm very concerned about that. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. They are, uh, there are no further hands raised on Zoom. All right, thanks. I'll close the public hearing. And Grant, I, I think we had a question for Ms. Beatty uh -huh. with respect to the parameters of HUD and how the money can be spent. Would you, can you review that for us, please? Absolutely. Uh, the city does fund homeless services with block grants through the nonprofit grant program. Uh, we fund Gathering for Women, Community Human Services, Interim Inc. We provide funding to Safe Place, which is the only youth homeless shelter in the area. That's right here on Pearl Street. And we also provide additional funding for the new family homeless shelter in Seaside, Casa de Notre Buena. Uh, we also help a Veterans Transition Center redevelop uh, duplexes on the former Ford Orb, which serve uh, low-income and transitioning veterans. 
Um, so we do use our block grant funds for homelessness on both the physical and capital improvements as well as the ongoing services. Oh, thank you for that, that good answer. That's, that's good for people to know. All right, back to the council questions. Are you ready to move on this? Council Member Allen? Oh, yeah, I appreciate the question and I just wanted to follow up. So Grant, is this use the sort of only use that we could um, dedicate this money to or could we in fact do as was suggested and dedicate it to um, providing either emergency or transitional housing for folks and give our um, community action team some tools to work with? Uh, this is not the only use. You could use it for more homeless services. Um, our action plan and HUD regulations state that you can increase funding to any program without doing a substantial amendment. Uh, so the purpose of this is just to allow the home repair loan program to go forward. And that does not preclude us from increasing our funding to other homeless services. So what we would have to do, I'm, I'm just to... Uh gathering the uh, the item today is talking about the home re rehab so if, if we wanted to like wanted to take a look at the whole cdbg program we'd have to re-agendize that well we are actually in the middle of our annual action plan for next year and okay. we'll be bringing that to council in april and the Good. planning commission in march uh, so in a sense that's already agendized and ready to go for the next yeah. cycle Oh, good. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, this is an amendment to the fiscal year 21-22. Yes. Uh, so we have made for 21-22 already commitments. This is an, yes. uh, an additional amendment for the money identified for the uh, major re rehabilitation loan program. What Council Member Hafa is expressing is probably uh, absolutely uh, something that we can bring forward as part of the planning that is underway for, for next fiscal year. Excellent, I, I hope that answers your question. Council Member Allen? Yeah, it does. I understand we could do it for next year, I guess. I'm trying yeah. to understand, could we do it for this year as well? Or is this the only action that we can take um, to allocate these funds at this time? Uh, no, you can allocate, as I said earlier, additional funds to the existing programs. Uh, those just don't require it substantial amendment by HUD regulations. Uh, so we can, if we have additional revenue, that can automatically go to those existing programs. Okay, Council Member Dan. Um, yes, thank, thanks Grant. That would mean though that either A, we'd have to have additional funding or we would have to pull funding out of other uh, budgeted areas mm -hmm. of this, I would think, right? It, it's only if we had additional. Correct. It's only if there's additional. So if in our case, we're a very special community development block grant program and that we have a lot, potentially a lot of program income, depending on loans that get paid off. Uh, so we budget conservatively. And then if we have additional funds come available, uh, we can fund programs at a higher level. Um, most block grant programs don't have the amount of income we have. So um, this is kind of a unique and good problem to have. So what I was saying is for this budget year, though, we would have to pull it out of something else unless we had uh, additional dollars. Correct, yes. Okay, thank you. And so member Ed? Yeah, I was just gonna highlight the, <clears throat> the significance of this um, home repair program because I hear from folks that have been able to participate with this that you know a small amount of money of maybe 10 or $15,000 meant um, the fact that they could stay in their home, which I think is the key benefit of this program. So I look forward to April when we can review the whole uh, block grant priorities and see if there's opportunities to, to move some dollars around. But today, uh, I think we should continue to say that we want to champion the program of being able to uh, take applications for some small work projects to keep people in their homes. And uh, things like whether heater is out and they, and they have no ability to replace the heater or they have a broken window or a sliding glass door no longer works. So things that may be you know, simple for someone who's in the, the livelihood of uh, being earning but then when someone is a senior or some of their income and everything is very tight. So we, we all know of folks that are like that. So the benefits of this program uh, are something that's very near and dear to I think all of us. So I absolutely support it. Look forward to the conversation in April about the whole program. 
I don't think I'm going to be able to support this. I, I see a difference, which is that somebody who owns a home, even if they're currently low income, is sitting on a, a pretty valuable asset in Monterey that they could take a home equity loan out on, for example, to, to certainly buy a, a heater or some other thing of that sort. What, as opposed to we have an immediate, I think, crisis that we've been nibbling around the edges. We're trying to do things. We've heard Gene Rash speak many times about the um, problem. Um, her suggestion was giving our community mm -hmm. action team vouchers to be able to, you know, put people in in hotels. I don't know if that's the right the right move or or what is, but I think, um, you know, simply moving. We know that. There, there's going to be pressure as we get into the hospitality hot season to simply move people along. And we know there's not enough places for them to go. And, uh, and so I think that's a more immediate and a more broadly, uh, that's an issue that affects the whole community as opposed to a handful of people who probably have assets at their disposal um, if they're willing to pursue things like a home equity loan. So to me, I, I, I don't think I'm gonna be able to support the recommendation. I would maybe make a, an alternative motion. I guess there isn't a motion. So my motion would be, we ask staff to come back with a proposal to allocate these funds for um, transitional and emergency homeless services, possibly to be administered by our CAT team or whatever the police chief and the CAT um, team experts recommend. That would be a motion. Is there a second? I'll second it for the discussion. Um, Go ahead, I'm, Council Member Tyler. I'm just wondering if we can just have some alternatives presented by staff. I, I wonder if there's some additional insight that they might have um, in regards to how the funds could be allocated in with different uses. Um, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily limit it to homelessness services either. I, I wonder about services for the renter community. Um, so I, I, I didn't want your, your motion to die, Alan, but I wonder if there's a way that we can adjust it somehow to have staff come back with some alternatives to present to us. Yeah, I mean, I, and I was trying to speak to that a little bit, maybe not very eloquently with the idea that, um, you know, the chief of police and the community action team experts would give us that insight. So I don't really want to tie staff's hands, but yes, how, how can we deal with the immediate homeless, uh, homelessness and housing crisis with these funds? And I, I don't disagree with you about your, your goal. I would simply say that changing the current um, HUD CDBG would have to go back to the planning commission unless I'm wrong. I think you're wrong, Mr. Mayor. From what right. I heard, it, and Grant, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, what I'd we're doing is actually amending it. This would not require an amendment. Is I that don't correct? Know. I, I think don't know. So. Thank you. I hope I'm wrong. <clears throat> Does anyone know if this goes back to the, if we uh, revise our uh, CDBG grant, then what's the process? Does it go to planning commission? Does it have to go back to Washington, have their approval and come back? My point is by the time we do all that, we're gonna be in April anyway. If, 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 if I may uh, provide an alternative uh, suggestion maybe uh, that, that, that may uh, satisfy council member Hoffa as well. Um, so, so the Mr. Fixit program, the re rehabilitation program, is, uh, is a program that, that we discontinued uh, when we put all the money into the emergency rental assistance program. And at that time, we, uh, council may recall, we actually had some folks that, that sent you separate letters, uh, as mostly senior citizen who told you that this was a harsh measure to take all the funding away because they really needed to fix the roof and fix the front porch or all those other good things that, that Council Member Smith talked about. So this is a very cherished program that retains people in their homes. And um, I cannot really say that they should just take an equity line of credit. They might already be tricked out with, with second mortgages and reverse mortgages, et cetera. And it really, um, we always perceive the program as something that makes sure that 
those residents stay in their homes and are not being forced to, to leave their neighborhood. We can come forward, and this is my, my suggestion to you, Councilman Mahafa, we can come forward to you uh, in one of the next meetings with a proposal uh, to spend an additional, and I don't know what the money is right now, but as Council recalls, we got uh, a one-time settlement. Kim Cole, you are here online when we did the re uh, um, um, Dunecrest Avenue when we worked on that. And there is an additional payment that we have received and we, we can are free to do with that money what we want to do. And, and, and Kim, if you could just chime in and, and remind us where it's coming from and how much that is. It is in, in the area of 70 to, to $80,000. And that might be something we can in addition to that propose. It's $72,000. Um, that dedication was made um, for the extension of the development agreement for two parcels on Del Monte Beach, 20 and 22 Spray. And we have received that money and recorded the agreement. So, um, and that $72,000 is not subject to any federal or state um, requirements in terms of, anyways, there's a lot of regulations that come along with our HUD funding and where and how it can be spent and how much can go to social service agencies. So we, uh, the council could agendize $72,000 and debate how to spend that money. Okay, yeah, right. I just wanted sure you to know good that. information. Uh, council member Allen, does that sound good to you? Well, uh, I guess I don't understand why we can't go forward with the proposal as I made it, which is we have $100,000 of new money. That money can be allocated within our existing uh, CDBG budget to things in it, which includes homelessness services. So I'm not sure why we want to defer that to something that may happen in the future. and. Uh, I think we're faced with difficult decisions where you have to look at what's a greater priority. Uh, I think helping a handful of people who are homeowners, obviously they tend to get the most attention from the city and from council. Um, but I think those same folks are not very happy seeing people camping on Del Monte Beach. And I think in a very short order, there's gonna be a lot of pressure to um, deal with that. And I would like to make sure we have the resources to deal with it in a humane and effective way. Um, so. Thank you for the clarification. I think uh, I, before I go back to the council, Grant, did you want to do some uh, clarifying for us? Yeah, just a few clarifications on the technical side. Uh, council member Hoffa is correct that the action before you is to make a substantial amendment and we're in the public comment period for that. So. Uh, it's up to the council to, to take action and you can change the staff recommendation. Um, however, uh, as you may recall, through the years past during our annual action plan presentations and our CAPER presentations in September, we are limited by HUD regulations on what we can spend the money on. And one of those limitations is a 15% cap for public services. And so if we have new money, uh, you know, 15% of that could go to a public service. But if we go over that 15% cap, we risk getting a negative finding from HUD on our annual audit. Uh, so we have to stay within that cap. Um, another cap is 20% on administration, for instance. The other programs such as home rehab or public infrastructure do not have those caps. So uh, we don't run into that concern with the home repair loan program. Uh, but uh, we do have that 15% cap on public services. Okay, thank you for that uh, clarification. Council Member Ed? Yeah, I just wanted to highlight, I think the, the city manager uh, spoke about, which was the Mr. Fix-It program that we had was very successful. Um, however, we shifted from that. And, and I think if we uh, stay to the true spirit of this agenda item, which is to rekindle that program, I'm sure that there's a pent up a list of programs or um, uh, repairs, uh, and yes, they may be homeowners. These may be marginal homeowners that are already strapped that have uh, limited income. This is an income qualification program that is 
I don't think we're giving away money for repairs uh, to folks that have got lots of assets or high income. So these are cases in the Mr. Fix It that is uh, uh, being able to keep people in their home so that they, they do not become in a situation where they do get displaced. So I'm still in support of the Mr. Fix It. I'm very much in support of listening to staff's options as it comes back with this new possibility of revenue that is just in from the Doomfest property. So I, I just think we don't need to rush this and start just grabbing dollars and throwing it away. Let's let's be cautious about this. Take this item tonight, give staff an opportunity to come back with unincome money that's outside of um, CDGB qualifications, but we may, able, we may be able to do um, some things that are rapid fix that also target the problems that um, Council Member Arthur was talking about, because it sounds like the program dollars and the percentages uh, would not amount to as much money as, as we may be able to use from the new money new revenue. So I would rather take the action tonight and look for staff to bring back ideas on the, the new $72,000. Thank you, Council Member Dan. Thank you. So um, I just wanna make sure with the Fix It program that uh, people that are uh, qualified for it, uh, as Ed said, um, need it for their home heating and uh, utilities uh, that they keep them in their in their building. Uh, I'm sure that even though, as Mr. Hoffa mentioned, that um, they may have quite a bit of equity in their home, but equity doesn't mean anything if they don't have the monthly uh, payment to make for that uh, equity loan, basically. So, I mean, it's it's difficult. Uh, so Grant, I wanted to ask a question about the 15% again. So are you saying that the $100,000, we can only use 15% of the $100,000 for services? Or is that in total of the grant, total grant? In totality for our housing program budget, block grant budget, 15% can go to community development block or can go to the public services. So, so again, how, how much of that $100,000 if we abide by and make sure we're not out of uh, compliance, how much of that $100,000 can we use for services? Well, 15% of 100,000. That's what I thought. That's what I'm talking about. So, so Alan, um, to um, amend your motion, what if, what if we made a motion that we carved out 15%, at least 15% for services? That's a, that's a, a, a worthwhile um, proposal. But I just do want to clarify, Grant. So when you say for services, do you mean nonprofit provider services? Or would it be different if the money went to our own city staff to distribute in the form of hotel vouchers by our police officers? Would that be a different category? Is that a valid category? And would that be subject to the kind of services 15% limitation? Uh, well, the short answer is yes, it would be subject to it. Um, HUD looks at what product or program is being delivered, uh, not who's delivering it. So theoretically, city staff could do all of the programming currently done by nonprofits, and you'd still be subject to that 15% cap. Um, we have the grant, grant program because they're the experts in the field, and so it, it makes a lot of sense to just fund them. So I, I would be open to that. It seems like that's our only option, Councilmember Dan, and I appreciate that. I would just observe, it's interesting to me that that HUD limits us to 15% on basically services that help people directly that really need that help. But if you want to give money to homeowners, there's no limits. It's kind of interesting. Thanks. Well, the background but I would be open to that. Just for your background, I, I have the same, um questions a long time ago HUD is interested in providing permanent housing mm -hmm. and, and and that that is their mission and and that's why the rules are according to them so so i i had the same question so a long time ago that that i was wondering why there are caps on on some of the spendings but uh they uh HUD, hud's mission is is to to provide permanent housing and uh that's that's what they focus on in the regulations as well and and uh, you might recall council member when we wanted to use emergency rental assistance program we had to go to hud as well because we wanted to to jump through some hood uh some hood some uh <laughs> jump through some hoops 
so so um yes um um great points uh it's it's uh it may be time for her to adjust the mission a little bit because some of those funds could be better used in transitional uh service providers so, so with thanks that for in... that clarification council member tyler yeah i just wanted to clarify um real quick so it sounds like the infrastructure funding though wouldn't be subject to the 15 percent. is that correct grant that's correct so our infrastructure with uh, C chs or vtc is not subject to that and so if we were to allocate some of the funding in that direction then it would allow some more flexibility in regards to alan's motion uh, well we need a, a proposal from one of those uh for, from an agency to do an infrastructure project at the moment uh the projects funded in this year's action plan are not requesting additional funds okay I just wonder if, if, and then I imagine too that that funding would have to be spent within this fiscal year as well, right? Well, correct. Yes, this is a time constraint, so we have until June thirtieth to spend this funding. Okay, so I'm not sure what your thoughts are, um, Alan, but you know, if there's capacity for staff to check in with them, and if there is a way that they could use it and and you know allocate this funding towards the the infrastructure projects that they might be working on. But I'm just throwing that out to kind of look at other possibilities here. Well, I think given the time constraints, I think Dan's suggestion is a really good one. I'm not sure procedurally, Mr. Mayor, if I wanted to amend my motion, if I could, or somebody would make a substitute motion or. Well, I, I would suggest if you don't mind withdrawing your motion, that's simpler. If the second agrees okay. and let's try a new one I'll rather than try to amend anything. All right, so um, who wants to try another motion then? I'll try it. All so, right. Um, I make a motion that we um, that we accept the recommendation from staff on uh, the CGB um, with uh, a carve out of 15% for services uh, necessary uh, to what Alan was talking about. Homeless services. Okay. Homeless services, I'll, thank I'll you. I'll second that. Okay, motion and a second. Any more discussion? Um, yeah, just I, I love the creativity, but I just am, am not comfortable with us trying to do this on the fly when we have opportunities that are yeah. uh, a couple of months away. We have program limitations. We have new monies coming in. And I'd like to pursue more details with that. Uh, so it sounds like we're talking about fifteen thousand uh, dollars that goes to homeless services. That I'm not sure where it's going to go and what it's going to do and what it's targeted for. Alan, you hey. talked about um, hotel uh, vouchers, and maybe that's something that would be at your own uh, chief's discretion and, and how that fits in. But, um, you know, I think that there is another larger question that we have to ask in terms of it's not only just the fact that there are people that are sleeping outdoors, many, many of them are doing so by choice. Many, many of them also suffer from mental illness and drug addiction. So our other programs where we give money to our services go a long way to directly attack the problem, which is presenting itself in the larger numbers, which is places like the interim and the Veterans Transition Center. And uh, Grant read them all off, and those are all very valuable. So I don't want to shortcut any program that they're doing, and I also don't want to just um, loosely give away money that adds to a problem when someone is not serious about stopping using drugs and getting off the street and they do suffer from mental illness so i prefer a more holistic approach rather than just carving out quickly in a meeting like this so i'm not going to support the motion because i i would rather us have uh, staff contributions about what they could actually do with the money Thank you. With that, I want to ask our city manager again um, <clears throat> if staff would be able to identify if the council is comfortable with the staff identifying where the extra fifteen thousand dollars would go. And you're yeah. the experts, not the councils or the policymakers. Yeah, we are also not the expert at handing in handing out hotel vouchers. So what what I'm envisioning right now is that that we would. If if uh, Grant says that's okay, we would allocate the fifteen thousand dollars to an organization like CHS, or or some some sort 
maybe spread it out five thousand dollars each to to salvation army chs and gathering for women for instance or is that something we could do grant uh, yes i think that's the cleanest logical approach is we to go to our current service providers say we have additional funding and, so so, um, so if, if, if if council is is is, is um willing to 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 allow that we would just take the fifteen thousand and uh give it to um um, um, a service provider, if you want to determine who that is right now, uh, let us know. It could be also the, the, the Seaside Homeless Shelter, uh, Councilman Mahafa. Uh, it could be also Gathering for Women. It could be split up. Uh, how, how would you, what, what's your pleasure, Council? I would, could, could I would it, appreciate if we put it in the motion and that way we, we have clarity. Could, could, it be, could it be to the Rental Assistance Program? No. It's already done. That's not a that that is not a service okay. provider in that Thank sense. You. All right. So the question would be to just uh, leave it to staff to uh, provide the money for homeless providers, or does the council want to specify right now which ones should get it? I'm not comfortable with that. I'd rather have Grant uh, see which homeless providers uh, or spread it out. I'd I think the council's intent is clear, and I think we can leave it up to staff to figure out. Which okay. provider can best do that? Yeah, yeah, that's fine with me. Okay, so that's fine with the motion and the seconder. All right, I might raise your comfort level to it. <laughs> um, yeah. So yes, it does. There's okay. more more specific. There, and I appreciate that. Okay, roll call, please. Ah, my fingers have to work fast. Councilmember uh, Williamson. Yes. Councilmember Hoffa. Yes. Councilmember Albert. Yes. Councilmember Smith. Yes. And Mayor Roberson. Yes. And you know, one of the, the many things I like about discussions that we just had, there's, and I always introduce you as our caring city council. Everything we were talking about is because this council cares so much about everybody in our city. So the next item is a public uh, appearance item, and that's to authorize remote teleconference meetings of the city council boards and commissions. For about a month, basically, we would be leaving this hybrid and go uh, totally online. So, Hans, if uh, you would yeah, like to add to uh, that, that's basically what we're talking we about. We are just asking you to allow us to um, uh, to attach, to, 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 to allow us to, to adopt the, the resolution which authorizes emergency teleconferencing through February 17, 2022. Um, uh, I think. Nat or Clementine have a slide on that one as well. So, uh, okay, I'm not sure. Can I ask a question, Mayor? Sorry. Can I, ask, can I ask a question, Mayor? Of course. Yes. Thank you. So, um, is this the same as the agenda item that was in consent in December? No, this is different because it allows us to go to uh, just virtual uh, teleconference okay. meetings. Clementine has a presentation. The, the ones that were in front of you were hybrid meetings. Okay, I'll wait for the presentation then okay so if you have a quick presentation this isn't our first rodeo on this we'll go there ahead and turn it, is. it over there it is mr mayor uh so this is a um uh basically based on the omicron variants and and the outbreak that we see right now in the county as well as in the city uh we ask you to allow us to schedule remote teleconference meetings of the council and the boards and commission committees for the period starting tomorrow through february 17 2022 and direct staff to conduct 100 percent remote public meetings good all council right may direct staff to resume hybrid public meetings when you think it's safe thank you questions <laughs> yeah. let's go to the public are there public input on this please Nothing from the council chambers. Thank you, Chief. And not on Zoom either. All right, back to the council. I'll make a motion to authorize remote teleconference and approve the resolution. Second. So if there's no more discussion, roll call, please. Um, okay, I just saw a, a hand go up. I'm not sure if you'd like to hear that feedback. Or no, that, yes, wait. please, because it's a little awkward. Normally, if we were all yeah. uh, in, a, yeah, in person, okay. Okay. Um, this person is labeled Racker. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Mike Brassfield. 
Hello, since Mike. we've already we've done this once before and we don't know where it's going to go, may I suggest that you put a mechanism in place to quickly extend by month in this process? That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And it's my understanding, uh, city manager, that don't we have to do this monthly by the law, state state directive? This has to come forward at least every 30 days. Um, yeah. It's yeah. renewed and the council reviews the state of emergency and determines whether they consider it to uh, pose safety risks to participants to appear in person. And so at the point in time when, um, when you review the findings and find that it's not unsafe, that's when you can make changes to the findings. Yeah, and I, I think Mike's suggestion is a good one, but we're hampered by the state law that said you have to review this every month. All the boards that I'm on, and I'm sure all of you go through this same mechanism. All right, roll call. Yes, Council Member Albert. Yes. Council Member Williamson. Yes. Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Hoffa. Yes. And Mayor Roberson. Yes. All right, finally, before we recess, we have a first reading on an amendment to the contract between the city and the Board of Administration of CalPERS. So again, we'll turn it over to our collaborative city manager for a presentation from him and his outstanding staff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is um, also an item that um, we, we negotiated and I'll point punt it over to our HR director, Alison Hauk, who can uh, provide you with some more background why we need that resolution uh, approved by you tonight. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, what you have before you is a request for a resolution of intent to modify our uh, CalPERS contract that for a retirement amendment. There's a short line in that contract that says that we have an hourly exclusion for employees paid on an hourly basis. And the request before you tonight is to actually list the positions in that will be in the contract amendment that cover our part-time seasonal employees and also modifying the names of those positions so that there's no confusion between a part-time seasonal employee and our full-time and regular part-time employees. We do have some overlapping titles. So this is just first uh, and a resolution of intent to amend the contract with CalPERS, a first reading of that contract with CalPERS, the ordinance to amend the contract, and then also a resolution to do our own internal process to actually modify those names so that when it's read a second time for the final approval of the ordinance amending the contract, we will actually have those names as our part-time seasonal position. So it's offering more clarity for CalPERS so that there's no confusion over who's covered by our retirement benefits and who's not covered because they are a part-time seasonal employee. Take any questions if you have any. Yes, Council Member Hoffa. Yeah, so does this have the potential to increase or decrease our pension liability, or is it more or less cost neutral? Is it really just about clarifying, you know, um, who is eligible and who isn't eligible? Um, could you just say a little bit more about the potential financial implications? Absolutely. There should, by doing this um, amendment, there shouldn't be any change to our current status quo. Um, we've had this contract amendment since 1966, and it's never had clarity, and actually cities all have different classification plans, and I think for CalPERS, they're not really sure who's covered or not covered under our plan, so this just provides more clarity for them. So our part-time seasonal employees are our employees that are paid hourly that work a thousand hours or less per year, so they're not our full-time positions. A lot of them are our camp counselors, but we do have people that we um, work with throughout the year, but they typically work about 20 hours or less per week. Um, so this isn't going to change um, anything status quo of what we're doing with our employees. It just is going to provide clarity for CalPERC. So it should be a cost neutral um, contract amendment. That was a great question. Anyone else? Uh, let's see if uh, we have any public comment. None in the chamber. Chambers, none from the council chambers, Mayor. 
All right, thanks, Chief Dave and Clementine. Anyone online? No, nobody online. All right, well, back to the council for action, please. I'll make a motion that we approve our agenda item number 10 for first reading. I'll second, second that. All right, unless there's more discussion, roll call. Councilmember Hoffa? Yes. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Councilmember Albert? Yes. Councilmember Williamson? Yes. Sir. And Mayor Overson? Yes. With that, that concludes our afternoon session. So we'll take a recess. We'll see everyone at seven o'clock. Thanks to our public staff and council for an interesting afternoon. We'll see you a little later. We're recessed.
So we want to welcome everybody back to our evening session of our city council meeting. We're glad that you all have been able to join us through one media or another. Uh, before we start, as always, we're going to ask our talented city clerk, Clementine, to explain how people can participate in this meeting. The city of Monterey is committed to the safe attendance of its public meetings. We didn't seem to have anyone in the chamber just a moment ago, but masks are required for all who attend in person, regardless of vaccination status, except those who are younger than two years old or have a medical condition that prevents wearing a mask. Attendees in the council chamber should keep phones and devices muted to prevent audio interference. And the city continues to offer virtual methods for public participation in meetings. There are two ways to virtually participate. You may join the meeting using the Zoom app on your computer or mobile device, and you can also call into the Zoom meeting. To join the meeting on Zoom on your computer, smartphone, or telephone, use the link or telephone number on the agenda at isearchmonterey.org. To call in by telephone, dial toll-free 833-568-8864, then enter meeting ID 160-772-9333-POUND. And if prompted to enter a participant ID, press pound. Detailed instructions on using Zoom are available at monterey.org slash public meetings. To make a public comment using the Zoom app, you may vir virtually raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. If you dialed in by phone, raise your hand by dialing star nine and then unmute yourself when called upon by dialing star six. You must do both. Public commenters will be muted until it is their turn to speak. And we'll call on each public speaker in the order of their hands raised. Please stay within the time limit that is established for today's meeting, which we'll show using a countdown timer on the screen. If you're connected live on Zoom, the timer is accurate with no delay. Today's meeting is also streamed live on the city's YouTube account at youtube.com slash city of Monterey with approximately 10 seconds delay and on Comcast channel 25 up to 90 seconds delay. As always, we look forward to receiving your public comment. Thank you. So nicely shared. And uh, once again, would you do the honors of introducing our caring city council, please? Yes, gladly. Council member Albert. Here. Councilmember Hoffa? Here. Councilmember Smith? Here. Councilmember Williamson? Here. And Mayor Roberson? Here as well. So we're going to go right into our, our one item of uh, business this evening, and that is to hold a third public hearing to receive public input regarding the composition of city council member districts. And we've had draft maps from our consultant, as well as many people from the public. And there's also direction to be given this evening on the potential sequence of elections. But once the districts are decided upon, which districts will be up in 2022? And that is through the discretion of the city council. So this evening, after we uh, have a staff presentation and more public input, the council is asked to give direction on which map maps or uh, adjusted maps that the council wishes to proceed for our next meeting when this will be codified and also to give direction to staff to prepare this terms of office. And so with that, I will go ahead and turn it over back to our collaborative Hans Uslar city manager, who I'm sure is going to introduce our commendable assistant city manager, Nat Rocha Nasa Thera. So it's all your city manager. Yeah, thank you so much. Um... Uh, uh, the mayor pointed out correctly what is ahead of us tonight. Uh, the public, uh, the council have seen the maps uh, starting December 28th, and uh, we had a chance to look at the maps, discuss the maps, explain the maps at our January 4th meeting. And, and tonight uh, it will be uh, your job uh, council members to recommend uh, to choose a map and recommend that map of uh, going forward to our fourth meeting uh, what we will ask you also tonight is to uh, provide us with your direction on the sequencing schedule to correspond with the map you have selected and um, what, what you will see tonight is basically uh, in essence uh, almost an identical presentation that we gave you on January 4th. However, 
uh, we also tried to uh, implement some of the questions that were uh, raised during the January 4th meeting and uh, uh, our assistant city manager, as well as listed from uh, redistricting partners will uh, be ready for all your questions and will guide us through the presentation. And with that, I hand it over to Ned for his presentation. Super, thank you, Hans. And uh, as we shared with all of you, this is our third public hearing. I will share my screen right now so you can all uh, follow along and, and see here. So what we'd like to do is uh, emphasize that tonight is a two-step process. The first is to have the city council hone in on one map to move forward in the process. And, and of course, uh, tweaks or changes to this map can be discussed or requested, but we do ask uh, by the end of tonight or as part of the first phase is that you choose one map to move forward. Mm -hmm. The second step is to then provide initial feedback on the sequencing of elections. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that uh, sequencing means, what that uh, those effects are, and. Uh, and how best to proceed with it. And then um, what we can also do is, uh, if council so chooses, staff can also include a recommendation for council to consider at the next meeting for, for, this, uh, for this process. So let's take a quick step back and look at the timeline, where we are today and how we got here. So uh, December 7th was when the first public hearing took place. This is where the council heard the criteria for how districts are created, it was decided by council to uh, create four districts with the mayor elected at large, consistent with the city charter. And then we also introduced the public input process. On December 9th, we had a community of interest form released along with a community meeting on how to give feedback. We also launched the uh, mapping station at the Monterey Public Library on that date as well. On December 21st, we had the second public hearing. This was a pre-map hearing to receive feedback from the community on boundaries as well as communities of interest. And then on December 28th, the draft maps were released. On January 4th, we held a public meeting to review those draft maps. And as Hans mentioned, it'll be this meeting will be a little bit of a repeat of, in terms of the presentation uh, from January 4th. And then uh, today we're here, January 18th, the third public hearing. Next steps, we'll have a fourth public hearing on February 4th with the, uh, with the final recommended map uh, to, to council. And we'll also introduce the ordinance for moving to district-based elections. And then two weeks later on February 15th, we'll have the fifth public hearing with the final map adopted. And, uh, and uh, that will be the, the final meeting. So that's our overall timeline. And just as a reminder, for those who are new to this process, the criteria for establishing districts, they must be relatively equal in size, and that's equal based on population, not citizens. Districts should be contiguous. They shouldn't hop or jump lines. They should be relatively compact in terms of appearance and function. They should maintain communities of interest. And then last but not least, they should follow the city boundaries. So the goals for today, just as a recap, is to have this public meeting. We've reviewed the timeline. We'll go over the draft maps. We'll talk about the sequence of elections, and then uh, we'll gather some feedback from council, and then, of course, take public comment as well. So uh, first and foremost, with the California Fair Maps Act, it's uh, very clear that starting in 2020, cities and counties have additional criteria for going through the district-based elections process. It must be a transparent process, which we've established since uh, we've launched this in November. And then uh, most very important is that the incumbent and uh, the residency of current council members or candidates uh, cannot be a factor. So our demographers, the folks who put together these maps, redistricting partners did not and, and still do not know where the current council members reside. And the districts can't be drawn to advantage a political party. So how, how have we gone through the process of engaging the public? We have all the information launched on our website at haveyoursaymonterey.org. Residents have been able to submit maps using the mapping toolkit. And then we've provided public hearing and public participation information available in Spanish as well. 
As part of our efforts, we've got the mornings with the manager. Hans delivers his updates on YouTube Live every couple of weeks, our social media and email blasts. There have been a number of newspaper articles, postcard mailers, two separate postcard mailers to every single household in the city of Monterey. We've launched the map making station at the library. We held the online uh, informational meeting. And then we've also issued print advertisements in the Monterey County Herald, as well as, I'm sorry, Monterey Herald, the Monterey County Weekly, as well as uh, El Sol, the Spanish language paper of record here in Monterey County. A summary of the public feedback that we've received so far as of this evening, 27 maps submitted by the public, 12 community of interest forms, and then over 64 emails and letters that have been uh, received, including about four or five we've received over the last hour. <clears throat> and all of the feedback, every single email that we've received is available online at haveyourstateinmonterey.org forward slash districting. So let's uh, talk about the development of the draft maps and I'll ask uh, Liz to go over these bullet points for us. Yeah, and good evening, council members, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. Um, so again, just like last time, um, these maps were created um, to reflect what the uh, uh, citizens of uh, Monterey are looking for. So these maps were created after looking at proposed maps and community of interest testimony. Um, they do not split census blocks, importantly. Um, and then neighborhoods and communities of interest are kept together as much as possible. Um, one big community of interest that was very resounding in this process were renters. So you'll see a lot of that renter data throughout this uh, presentation. Um, of course, uh, due to balancing of populations, we weren't able to keep all neighborhoods intact. And Nat will be able to go over where the splits happen. Um, but we really did try to keep the neighborhoods together as much as possible. You wanna go to the next slide? And then a couple meetings back, uh, we were asked to do a population shift analysis. Uh, so I wanted to include this uh, to show you how the population has grown over the last 10 years. Uh, so this is looking at the city as a whole. Uh, in 2010, the uh, total population was uh, just shy of 21,000. So 20,680, and then it grew uh, to 22,190. Uh, and then when we look at the citizen, or excuse me, that is the citizen voting age population. And this matters because it tells you how much of an influence um, each of these uh, Voting Rights Act protected classes have. So Latinos, Asians, and black residents. Um, so you can see that in 2010 to 2020, the Latino citizen voting age population grew by 35.2%. Um, and then when you look at the other populations, they are smaller. So you're gonna see a more drastic increase. Uh, so the Asian uh, population, CVAP population grew by 611. Uh, so that's a 66.6% .6 increase. And then the black CVAP population grew by 347. Uh, and because that is a smaller figure compared to the other categories that grew by 72.9%. And then when you look at the total uh, racial, um, not just CVAP, but everyone, so we're looking at non-citizens and we're looking at people under the age of 18, uh, you can see that the growth is even higher for the Latino population. So it, it grew by 48.1%. Um, the Asian population slower, so 6.9%. And then the... Yeah. Black population, 13.6%. And 
And then the COI testimony. So renters were very pivotal uh, during this process and still are. Uh, so here is the uh, map of renters in the uh, city. So you can see, and we'll show you uh, each uh, proposed map and we'll break down the numbers for renters versus homeowners. You wanna go to the next slide? Excellent. So these are four maps, abalone, bat ray, cuttlefish, and dolphin. So we're just gonna go through each one of those right now um, and break down what these maps mean in terms of demographics and neighborhoods. Perfect. So uh, this is the abalone map and um, let me see if I can skip out of this uh, so we can show you what that looks like in greater detail so uh hopefully you, you, you all see the screen here and uh the abalone map here has uh, district a includes new monterey and the majority of of uh, old town uh, we've got uh, district b which includes upper presidio uh, we talked a lot, quite a bit over the last several months about how the presidio of monterey includes dormitories so over thir over three thousand students reside on the Presidio, mostly here in Upper Presidio. Uh, and um, that's part of our citizen uh, population here that uh, should be accounted for. So that's attached here to the majority of Skyline Forest and Monterey Vista. And then uh, District C has most of downtown, Oak Grove, and uh, Via Del Monte and Luna uh, Grande. Over on the side, and then D is the, the rest of the city. So you've got uh, some of the lower parts of Monterey Vista, along with the Iris uh, Canyon Greenbelt, Alta Mesa here, uh, Glenwood, and um, the Navy Housing uh, down here, as well as uh, Kona and Fish Flats, Deer Flats, and Ryan Ranch, which currently has no no residents. Okay. Um, as we, we can see here, some of the neighborhoods split, some of the questions that we've received over the past couple of months, you know, why is this, uh, for example, area split where Harrison Street and, and these sets of homes that are clearly in Old Town, why is this attached to Skyline and, uh, and Monterey Vista? And the answer to that, for example, is that uh, oddly, the Census Bureau has this it's a very odd shaped uh, census block that goes from here all the way out to skyline so uh, it unfortunately needs to be attached that way uh, some other questions that we've received is uh, why why the lines are are in certain ways and as liz said they're trying to keep the neighborhoods intact as much as possible um, this district c here divides essentially the line at fremont street from the eastern part of the city all the way to, to downtown. Okay. So that's District uh, District A. And, uh, and Liz will talk a little bit about um, the uh, more, go in more detail here on the Abilene plan. So we're gonna go ahead and continue, hopefully uh, resume with that slide, or maybe not. <laughs> Well, thank you, Nat. We're gonna get into the renter percentages so you can see where renters are um, in this uh, in this abalone draft map. Um, so B has the largest amount of home ownership. Um, C and A, um, especially C, if you look at right in the middle, there's one census uh, track that is 91% renters. Um, and when we're looking at this, we're looking at homeowner or we're looking at renter uh, by housing units. Um, so this isn't total population, we're looking at the um, housing units. Um, so just to make sure we're clear on that, because it can get a little confusing. So 91% and of C in that area, 91% of the housing units are rentals. Um, and then if you go to B, you can see that only 2% in the middle is housing unit or rental units rather. 
and go to the next slide. Thank you. So here it breaks down uh, homeowner occupied versus renter occupied. Um, and you can see C has the highest amount of renters. Um, and in, was that B has the lowest amount of renters. And also in A, very high as well for renters, it's 66.6%. .6%. Um, and then when you look at D, it's flipped. So 62.4% are homeowners. And go ahead and go to the next slide. So with this map, um, if you wanna to go to the next slide, perfect. So the total deviation here is 7.5% um, for uh, those who um, are playing at home and wanna learn how to create a total deviation. All you have to do is look at the lowest deviation and the highest deviation and combine their absolute values. And that gives us the total deviation. Um, so it has to be under 10%. So we are good here. Um, and we can also look at the citizen voting age populations as well. Um, so down here, we have the Latino CVAP in uh, A is 12.6. The Latino CVAP for B is 9.8. C is 15.9 and D is 10.6. So those are the highest uh, percentages for the three uh, protected classes uh, that we often see in California. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And then we have bat ray. So rather than showing the other, other uh slide, I'll just share this overview uh, slide so I, I, you don't have to keep forwarding through the slide deck. But this bat ray plan uh, is one of the options here, combines Upper Presidio with, uh, with most of New Monterey, with the uh, Hawthorne Street being the dividing line here. And uh, the reason for that is the population, as we shared earlier, of the Upper Presidio of Monterey is uh, so great that uh, we couldn't have one district be all of New Monterey and Upper Presidio without going over the, the target population. So um, that's uh, why registering partners drew it uh, this way. This also has a uh, lower part of New Monterey is being part of the, the B district, if you will, that also includes Old Town, most of uh, downtown and uh, the majority of, of uh, Monterey Vista here. So. And then uh, District C includes Skyline mostly, along with uh, Alta, Alta Mesa, and, uh, and you also have um, La Mesa Village and Fish Flats, Deer Flats, and uh, Ryan Ranch. And then the D district here combines Oak Grove with Via Del Monte, Del Monte Grove, and Kona. Okay. We'll go ahead and here's each of these maps in the atlas actually has the 16 distinct neighborhood boundaries that's overlaid on top of the draft district so you can see how the uh, the lines either match perfectly or uh, sometimes in, in some cases may split a specific neighborhood yeah and we used those neighborhood lines while we were drawing so uh, tr again tried to split it as few times as possible and then here is the heat map um, of renters again. Uh, and actually, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And so you can see here the breakdown of owner versus rental occupants. Um, so in, let's see, the highest renter uh, percentage is in D, so it's 75.7. Uh, and interestingly enough, C is pretty evenly split here. Uh, so 50.5 versus 49.6. Uh, importantly, um, I know I'm getting down to the decimal, but these are all estimates. Um, so keep that in mind too. It could be, you know, a few uh, percentages off, um, but this is about the ballpark. Um, so, and then, oh, 
go ahead. Uh, oh, I was just gonna go through, uh, perfect. So now we have the deviations for this one. It's not very different uh, from A. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So it's 7.2% deviation. Again, it's under that 10% uh, that it needs to be. Um, and when we try to keep neighborhoods intact, that is naturally just going to make the deviation a little bit higher. And then again, when we look at the Latino CVAP, it looks fairly similar to um, MAP Abalone. So it is, again, Latino CVAP is the highest out of the three protected classes, and it is 13.8 for A, 9.6 for B, 8.2% for C, and then 16.9% for D. Next slide, perfect. So this is the cuttlefish draft uh, plan map, and you'll see here District A has all of New Monterey along with the majority of Old Town is in A, in B, all of Skyline with the uh, majority of, of uh, Monterey Vista, and then uh, C, you've got the lower portion of Monterey Vista along with downtown Oak Grove and uh, Alta Mesa. Uh, and Glenwood and La Mesa Village on this side. And then uh, D, uh, what we have here is uh, uh, Del Monte Beach, of course, along with uh, Via Del Monte, Del Monte Grove, Casanova Oak Knoll, uh, known as, also known as Kona, and then uh, Deer Flats and, uh, and Fish Flats and Ryan Ranch. So that's the cuttlefish plan. And, if any of the council members would like uh, to see more detail where any of these lines are divided, we're, we're happy to do that uh, later on as well. And this is the neighborhood uh, dividing lines here overlaid on top of the cuttlefish draft plan. And back to Liz. Yep, and here's the heat map again. Uh, so we can see the renter population and go to the next slide. Perfect. So this breaks down renter versus homeowner. Um, you can see that the highest homeowner rate is in B, and that's at 60 or 76.9%. Uh, and the highest renter uh, is 66.1 in A. Nope, it is 76.2 uh, in C. Uh, and the other ones hover over 60, about 65%. So it's 66 and then 63 in A and D respectively. And you go to the next slide, perfect. So the total deviation here is just a little bit lower than the other th two. So it's 6.5% here um, and then again the latino cvap population is not that much different than the others Can go to the next slide here's the uh, fourth and, and final uh, draft map uh, for your review this one is called the dolphin plan and uh, this has district a which includes all of new monterey and the majority by far the majority of uh, old town in District B, you've got uh, all of Skyline Forest, Upper Presidio, and um, the majority of the Monterey Vista neighborhood. And then in uh, District D, uh, you've got downtown, uh, the lower portion of uh, Monterey Vista, Alta Mesa, Glenwood, La Mesa Village, and then Fish Flats, Deer Flats, Ryan Ranch. And then in District C, you have a district that includes Oak Grove, Del Monte Beach, Via Del Monte, Del uh, Laguna Grande, uh, and uh, as well as Kona, Casanova Oak Knoll. So we'll go ahead and go to the neighborhood maps and you can see how the dividing lines are when you compare them with the neighborhood overlay. And then here's the uh, renter map. Back to Liz. Great, thank you. Yep, here's the heat map. Um, and I believe all of these maps uh, and this slide it slideshow is available to the public 
um, on the website. So the public can go there and take a look um, at a future time and study these a little bit more if they would like. Um, we would love to have this um, analyzed by the public and let us know what they think of the map. So go to the next slide. And then here is the breakdown of homeowners and renters. You can see in C, uh, that has the highest percentage of renters. So 75.7% 7, renter. Uh, and then the other, so A and D, those two are about 65%. And then B has about 23.1% renter. Uh, so that is the final breakdown of uh, the renter and homeowners. Mm -hmm. yeah, we wanted, I think I wanted to uh, want to add that uh, while we talk a lot about renters and they are indeed a community of interest, there's also the citizen voting age population and the racial demographic breakdown, which we, we've talked about too, which is uh, the reason why we've moved to district-based elections. Uh, so that's something to be mindful as well as we talk about and share data on renter as well as uh, the citizen voting age population for the Latinx population here in the community. Absolutely. And then go to the next slide. Perfect. So this one total deviation is eight point, or it's eight. Uh, it is the highest out of the four maps, but again, under 10%. Uh, and then we break down the Latino CVAP Again, this is the highest out of the three classes. So we have 12.6% for A, 9.9% for B, 16.9% for C, and then 8.9% for D. Go to the next slide. Okay, so this is the sequence of elections and uh, the second part, once council decides to sign on one map, we'll talk a little bit about the potential sequence of elections and the fact that two districts will have to uh, be assigned to uh, to go up uh, for election in November of 2022 and the other two districts in November of 2024. And some of the legal requirements here, uh, first and foremost, the city council shall give special consideration to the purposes of the California Voter Voting Rights Act of 2001. And that means protecting the ability of a protected class to elect candidates of its choice. And uh, CBRA uh, states that the protected classes are the, um, in this case, Latinx, uh, the Asian American Pacific Islander, as well as the black community members. And those are the protected classes. And you have data on that in, in the documentation. In terms of how districts uh, are phased in, so um, council members whose terms expire in 2022 will serve the city through November of 2022 and then can run for district based seats in November 2022, provided that they reside in a district scheduled for November of 2022. And then council members whose terms expire in November of 2024 will serve the city at large for the remainder of their term. And they'll also have an opportunity to run for district-based seats in November of 2024, provided that they reside in a district that's scheduled for November of 2024. So what happens if multiple current council members live in the same district? Well, if the election is held in 2022, the incumbents can run for election in that district along with any other candidate. And the person who receives the most votes will win the seat in that district. Now, if a council member whose term is up in 2024, they win a district-based seat in 2022, he would then resign his at-large seat, and then the at-large vacancy would be appointed by the council. And what if no council member resides in the district? So if that's the case for the November 2022 election, only non-incumbents will be qualified to run for election in that district. And then if no council member resides in a district scheduled for the November 2024 election, that district would be represented by the remaining at-large council members until 2024, when its first district-based election will be held. And then uh, this is some data that uh, Liz and the team at Redistricting Partners uh, 
put together based on feedback and uh, questions from council at our last meeting. So I'll ask Liz to explain it further. Yeah, so here is the Latino voting turnout for midterm and presidential elections. Um, as you can see here, midterm elections have a lower turnout, a much lower turnout um, for Latino voters. This is the same across the board though. So midterm election 2014, Latino voter turnout was 23.3%. Overall, 35.5%. We look at the 2016 presidential, it's about 52% versus 61%. So this is a almost doubling uh, of turnout. And then you look at the midterm in 2018, it's 47.6%, 58.9% for the total city. And then the presidential, much, much higher, 76.8%, 81.7% for the total voter turnout. Um, what this tells us is if we sequence, um, if our goal is to have a, the most impact for Latino voters, we would want a district with a high Latino voter population, uh, CVAP population, to go and be sequenced during an election year. So, or excuse me, a presidential election year. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to read aloud all of the Latino uh, CVAP percentages. So you can get a sense of which districts were higher than others. If you do choose to um, select the sequencing based off of this data. And again, a, a recap. Uh... Tonight's decision-making process is, is two steps. One is to choose the map to move forward. And then uh, once that's been decided, we uh, can, would like to get feedback from council regarding the sequence of elections. And uh, at this time, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much. Uh, there's a lot of information this evening, but a great deal of it has been shared before, but all of the uh, the apartment information is brand new. So many thanks to our redistricting partners, Paul and Liz. Uh, it's it's you've done a, a lot of work for us. Of course, our assistant city manager, who's been our lead on this, Nat. Thank you too. A great deal of detail, and you met all the uh, the check the boxes that they say about outreach, trying to get as uh, and many media out there to get as much public input as you possibly could. Because once we received the request from LULAC, we, be, we got on a, a very strict timeline. Mm -hmm. And it's commendable, I think, that we've met that timeline through the incredible work of our consultants and our staff. I wanted to assure the public before we have council questions that all of the emails uh, we, we've been studying have your say, Monterey. We've we've studied these maps over and over again. So I want everyone to know that the input that you've given us up to this evening has been heard by your council, studied, not deliberated, <laughs> but certainly thought about. And and I, I recall uh, Voltaire saying, "Don't let the best be the enemy of the good," he, but more easily translated as, "Don't let perfect get in the way of good." And all of these maps have uh, merit and value, and depending on one's uh, perspective, one map may be one that you like better than another, but I would say all of the public input has been fairly evenly distributed as to maps that various people prefer. So your council is gonna do its best to come up with a map that we think best meets the California Voters' Rights Act. So any questions before we get public input? Council Member Dan, please. Thank you, Mayor. So um, I've gotten uh, a quite a bit of in, uh, input from some of my constituents. And one of the biggest questions they have, which is kind of interesting, is mm -hmm. why, why does it uh, a strip extend into the bay? 
on all the maps? Why does it go all the way up into the bay? Maybe the, maybe the question's already been answered, but- no, I'm happy to answer, answer that. Answer. And, and it's a very good question. Uh, the city's boundaries actually extend uh, that far into the bay. And uh, we, the census data uh, also has the census block actually goes, goes that far. And we do have some liverboards who, uh, who reside uh, in the harbor. And, and so the harbor has to be part of the district as well. So that's part of the council's uh, final map. Okay, thank you. That, that's, a, that's an answer I can very easily give to the people <laughs> that are asking me that question. Uh, the second question is, I know it came up in our last conversation, um, but um, could uh, the consultant please explain uh, uh, splitting streets in half? One would be in one district and one would be in the other. If, if they can explain that to the people that didn't hear it the last time we spoke. So splitting streets, um, do, do, are you referring yeah, for to instance, For instance, the, the example was Harrison Street, where one side of Harrison Street would be in one district and the other side of Harrison Street would be on the other. And why don't we just go ahead and just put uh, both sides of the street in one district? Well, it really depends on the census block. So some of these census blocks are oddly shaped. Um, just a reminder, these census blocks are created by computers uh, from the US Census Bureau. So uh, these are not human beings uh, thinking about how things are being put together, but they are computers. Um, so my assumption is that's a census block that is probably oddly shaped. And if we try to include the other side of that street, uh, it would put the population uh, at a percentage that would be too high of a deviation. So it's not based on, um, meaning that the districts are not strictly on uh, going by census blocks. I mean, you can split census blocks when you create it or you cannot. You cannot split census blocks. Okay. So that's why we can't add that side of the street. I see. Even though logically it makes sense that we should have that side of the street there. Um, this computer that created this shape um, didn't recognize that. I see. Okay. That, and that's I'll, the two I'll add to you, you know, uh, to, to that. If let's say if you do move it uh, over, you would then split the other street. So, for example, Harrison Street is split on one side uh, in one district, one in another. Uh, if you say let's pick the next census block over, it then splits another street where Roosevelt Street, for example, would then would then be split. Um, if you look at all the maps, the, nearly every single one has uses the city mm -hmm. right. center and line have, as, as that split. I see, and you'd have to go through the whole, all the maps to continue to put them on. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. That was the only two questions I have. Mary. Okay, other questions? Uh, I have one then, have we had any feedback or input from LULAC with respect to any maps that they have a preference for or any sequencing that LULAC would be favoring? The, uh, the most recent feedback I received from uh, LULAC, I uh, received a call on Friday from Andrew Sandoval, who uh, is, uh, has been the lead uh, over at, uh, at that district. And uh, he did not specify a preference for a map. He, wanted to express his appreciation for our efforts in continuing the last uh, public uh, hearing that wasn't noticed uh, correctly and, um, and all the Spanish language translation. He, he says we actually, we go above and beyond uh, on, on translating all of our agendas and, and so forth. And then uh, he shared that when it comes to sequencing that uh, his preference is to uh, create the sequencing in a way that um, if if the maps happen to have uh, incumbents in those districts, uh, allow the incumbents to to run for op to be elected for those districts, uh, and uh, I think that's a, a practice that you know Liz has more experience about and can maybe speak to. But he he shared that with me, and I don't know if he'll be calling in to today's meeting, uh, but um, he wanted me to pass that along to council. Thank you, Nat. Now, and uh, 
I know we're going to get to sequencing later, but Liz, the la I think you were here with Paul last time, and mm -hmm. the question was asked how do different councils or cities in the state decide on sequencing? And as I recall, some of them pick them out of a hat, that you, as I recall, and there was another very interesting uh, um, formula, but I, I think it was pretty much up to the discretion of the city council. So could you just reiterate that, please? It is, and it's very standard for uh, the sequencing to follow when incumbents term out. Um, and if there is no incumbent, uh, or if there are two incumbents in one, in one district, then that's when you can start pulling numbers out of a hat or something like that to sort of randomize it. Um, but it really is very standard for um, the sequencing to follow when terms are up. Okay. Other questions before we go to the public? Council Member Ed? Yeah, a quick question on one of the last slides where you were talking about the sequencing and you highlighted the voting results from the 2016 presidential and the uh, 2020 presidential. I got the number for the 2020 and 81.7% mm -hmm. voter turnout. Um, but could you give us the 2016 again? That went by too fast for me. Sure, and Nat, can you pull that up, that slide? Yeah, I can do that. Uh, just bear with me for one second. Uh, so it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of reviewing and, and to the, to the core of the decision we'll be talking about later. It's that, you know, where, where, are we, where are we trying to address the whole point of this, which is any potential disenfranchised uh, per California voting rights is that we're, we're trying to make sure that we address the highest percentage of minorities and the best likelihood for the greatest turnout. So I wanna make sure I got the, Percentage right for 2016. So I think that was a valuable slide to see. So I'm wondering if we could see that again. Yeah, we, we can. Uh, my computer is uh, taking a few minutes longer to get to that slide. Uh, bear with me. Yes, yeah, a lot of data, data to read. Before I share it, I'm uh, tr trying to stall here <laughs> so while I wait for the. Uh, I, made, I made my statement as long as I could to give your computer <laughs> a I, I appreciate it. Not, not long enough, uh, Councilmember Smith. I, I think I know. Uh, I think Chrissy may have may have a comment as well. I, I, uh, perhaps. Um, so in, another uh, another way to do this instead of delaying this is maybe we could move on. And if you could have that ready, here we uh, go. After, I think. Oh, okay, you got it. Yeah. Okay, so 20, 2016 was sixty one point one percent overall. Overall, that's right. Um, 2016 was a relatively low voter turnout for a presidential election. I think everyone was very burnt out at that point. Um, and then 2020 felt very consequential. So that was a very high turnout uh, across the board. So 76.8% for Latino voter turnout mm -hmm. and then 81.7% for total city of Monterey voter turnout. Yeah, but it, the number is still greater on both presidential over the midterms. That's right. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. All right. Other questions, please. Anyone else at this point or ready to go to the public? Okay. Then at this point, uh, I don't know if our Chief Dave is in the council chambers. Did, did you get the night duty as well? Is there anyone yeah, we actually, uh, we're, we're working remotely and, uh, and, and so Mario is uh, in the chambers and it appears there's no one here in the public uh, ready to speak, so. Yeah, I walked over there at about seven and nobody was in there and I, I haven't watched anyone walk in. And, okay. and the, camera, the camera shows that there's no one in the chambers at this time. Okay, thank you for that. And, and just to inform people who more people may be watching this evening than you were this afternoon, and that uh, for the next month, the council and all boards and commissions will be remote only for this very reason because of the Omicron spread. So if you've watched any of that today, uh, estimating one out of five Americans have gotten Omicron and then um, the uh, CDC says it's probably four times that because a lot of people don't report it. So 
and also who said that possibly 50% of Western Europeans would get Omicron. So it was something that uh, it was recommended by our staff and many districts are doing that and jurisdictions, they're going remote again. So at our February meeting, folks, we'll see you on remotely. All right, Clementine, how are we looking for, uh, was there any more staff comment? And yeah, just one quick one and I apologize. I was having technical difficulties so I had to jump off and come back on and now my mic is suddenly working. Uh, <laughs> I just, as, a, as an additional point, um, just to add to the mix a little bit, and you heard, I think, from redistricting partners um, that there is an alternative method of thinking about this, which was taken, I believe, in a Southern California city, and I'm not remembering the name, Orange County somewhere, yeah, um, mm -hmm. right, where the, the focus really was on let's open up the election first um, and begin immediately for the seat that's likely to have the most members of the relevant protected class um, to get um, a minority elected first even if it may not be in the um, election with the higher highest voter turnout for that population. So it's just another way of thinking about it. Um, I don't think there's any case law or decisions that say one way or the other is more correct than the other. I just wanted to throw that out there as another um, factor to think about when it comes to the sequencing. Okay, thank you very much. That's our conscientious city attorney. Thank you. All right, so let's go ahead. Uh, Clementine, how are we looking as far as uh, a number of people who want to participate this evening? Well, so far I see eight hands raised. Um, perhaps anyone listening could raise their hand if they, now we've got nine, 10, so 11, 12. It's going up, Mayor. It looks like we'll have quite a few. Yes, okay. There are 14 now. 14 now, how does the council feel? Are, do, uh, I'm, do we want to go two minutes versus three minutes? Uh, do you have a feeling one way or another? Uh, Mayor, I think if we've got 14, 15 now, this, uh, I wouldn't want to rush it through the two, but try the three. And I think uh, if it takes a little bit longer tonight, it's important. I think we should hear yeah. from everybody. All I, right, I we'll think, stay with our three. Okay, and we'll see. I think as long as everybody stays at three. Oh, they will. And and also, I know we've heard from other pe people before, but it doesn't mean you can't speak again. But if you want to just say, yes, I reiterate what I said last time, that will help us because the last thing we want to be doing is at 11 o'clock trying to decide this. So with that, with the, we'll, we'll do our three minute limit. And we look forward to hearing from people. And when we're through with public comment, probably be an hour or more, then we'll take a break, then we'll come back. And so as you recall, you can raise your hand if you are participating with us on Zoom or phone in. So we look forward to hearing from you. It's open. All right, so first of all, just in case there's anyone in the chamber that we do not see on camera, if you would like to speak, please step forward to the dais, I mean, sorry, to the um, podium and we will call on you. But since I do see someone phoned in with the last three digits, 204, and I will ask that person to unmute. And please go ahead. Yes, good evening. Uh, Tom Rowley from uh, Fisherman's Flats. I called in the last time to say that uh, our initial review uh, showed that the compactness and the uh, tightness of the east and north Monterey in cuttlefish showed it was vastly superior. Um, some of the other, uh, like dolphin, splits up the areas, divides it in um, not sort of not ambiguous, but uh, areas that don't really make too much sense. The other thing is cuttlefish kind of has a dividing line at the Naval Postgraduate School that to the east and north all remains basically in the same uh, district. So that would be the key thing that I did not mention before is the failure, I mean, the fact that it is conti contiguous and compact and is a far superior uh, arrangement. So uh, thanks for all the hard work getting to this point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. And let's see, next let's hear from Rick Aldinger. Please go ahead. Hi, hi, good evening, thank you. Uh, Rick Aldinger, resident of, of the fine city of Monterey. 
Hey, so I, you know, I had the, I guess the dubious pleasure of sitting in on, on some of the, uh, the state redistricting process and, and, uh, given experiencing that, I really want to commend all of you on this process. Uh, there are many nuances and, and details to consider uh, all the while uh, following the law. And, and again, job well done. I, I, I also thank you for engaging redistricting partners. Uh, in particular, uh, you know, the, the intense engagement and focus uh, and attention paid to the uh, communities of interest component uh, during the, the, the process uh, uh, that seemed to be lacking statewide. And, and uh, I really appreciate the focus placed on that uh, during this process in our city. <clears throat> that all being said, uh, to me, it, it's pretty clear uh, that that dolphin, uh, the dolphin maps, the dolphin map does a really good job, the best job, in my opinion, of keeping neighborhoods and those communities of interest intact. And uh, uh, the, the existing neighborhood structure is, remains uh, mostly intact uh, on the dolphin maps as well. And so, uh, again, that would certainly be uh, far and above my preference moving forward, Plan Dolphin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. And as always, thanks for your service on our committee. Same with Tom on your different committees with the city. Okay, let's see next, I believe. Um, I believe this is Mike Brasfield. Yes, it is. Good evening, folks. I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, Having looked at, at these maps, probably more than I want to do, <laughs> the, when it comes down to, to communities of interest and the impact on, on protected uh, communities, I have to go with the only mammal in that list of fish, and that is <laughs> dolphin. Um, and I, as the mayor said, I'll reiterate my previous comments. But if you would uh, put me down for that dolphin, thank you. Thank you, Mike. All right, thank you. And next we have Rick Hoyer. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I am Rick Hoyer, resident of Monterey. Uh, while I submitted a map that's very close to what cuttlefish shows, I actually urge you to adopt dolphin or something very similar. For a few different reasons. One being it is the highest ratio of Latinos. It's the highest ratio of renters. It also meets one of the goals that a group of us put together when we asked for redistricting over a year ago. Uh, there's a large number of neighborhoods in this town who have never ever had a city council representation in the history of the city. And in Plan Dolphin, you will get an area of town having a council member for the first time in the city's history because none of those neighborhoods included in group in C within the Dolphin Plan has ever had a member on the city council to our knowledge. So we urge, I urge you to go that route. The other thing is the whole renter debate to me is what we've been seeing as percentages are very, very skewed because we treat all military as renters. They're there for a reason with the government doing it. They're not a traditional renter. They shouldn't be included in the percenters for what renters are in one area. Uh, my neighborhood happens to be grouped in with Glenwood Circle, so it's showing 70 some odd percent renter. Well, my neighborhood has a lot of renters, but nowhere near 70%. It's because Glenwood is so heavy. So it's not a true picture of what is, and in effect, they're spread throughout the city. So the one area that has the highest ratio of true absolute rental units with no ownership. There are areas in Villa Del Monte and Laguna Grande, and those are all covered in one area in the Dolphin Plan as well. So you have really socioeconomic groups kept together in that plan, ethnic groups kept together, as well as lack of representation in the city in the past is addressed in that plan as well. I urge you to, to go with the Dolphin Plan. Thank you. Thank you, Rick.
Thank you. And next, let's hear from Bruce Zanetta. <clears throat> yes, um, I assume you can hear me. We yes, can we can, Bruce. Um, uh, so I want to start with, um, uh, how do I put this? Um, the, the rub is in the, uh, the, the statement, I'm paraphrasing, the, the computer, um, this is done by computers with a, a single data a stream or data source and not by people. Um, but let, let me go on to a bigger picture uh, concern and view that I have. Um, across the nation and in these unusual times, special interests with motivations ranging from self-interest interested to the well-intentioned are busy chipping away at our democratic system and in institutions. Now it is Monterey's turn. Driven by statistical models based on limited data, we are seeing this, this city being transformed from a very dem democratic system of governance to a less than democratic system of governance. Small town America could often brag that they were more democratic in choosing their leadership than the greater by magnitudes nas national and state systems. But for this town, that is not now about to change. Wh where once we voted at large for our leadership, now we will only be uh, casting a vote for one council member as a singu singular representative. That, changes, that change moves us closer to the House of Representatives or the State Assembly than that more true democracy we have soon, we, we are soon to see as a past tense. I bring this up because we likely will miss that past, not just for once wearing that ideal on our lapels, but, but because the loss could likely have ramifications. We likely will see greater potential for misuse. There will be fallout, there will be collateral damage, there will be regrets. History tells us that, recent history is telling us that. History also tells us that often the road to hell is paved with good intentions. There will, there will be regrets. Finally, I, I would like to um, ask some questions concerning district designs and their spe specifics. The plan options that you will be deciding on all break up neighborhoods in some form or fashion. Most significantly, we see breaking up of the traditional neighborhoods on the west side with variations affecting neighborhoods of either Monterey Vista, Old Town, New Monterey, or combinations thereof. It seems clear to me that this is the this is the breaking up of communities of interest. So why is this? Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that this is an effort to deal with and, and work around the Defense Language Institute Presidio. Yet the DLI population does not in fact vote. So what gives? Not knowing more at this time on that, this I ask, why cannot the DLI be considered a separate entity and given a voice that matches their specific needs and situation in this community? And I will end there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And next, Jean Rash, please go ahead. Thank you. I'm calling again on behalf of the Monterey Vista Neighborhood Association, which has elected Cuttlefish as our choice. And it's pretty obvious why our neighborhood has um, not only been cut in half, but only cuttlefish keeps it as compact and contiguous as possible, given that it's divided. So all the other choices extend the part of Monterey Vista from Via Paraiso Park all the way to Ryan Ranch, which makes no sense. It's not contiguous, it's not compact, it's not a like-minded community, and you don't have to do it. So it will be very, uh, I will really wonder what the underlying motives are in electing anything but cuttlefish in that you have a choice which meets all the needs, is compact, contiguous, and does not sever neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Next, let's hear from Robert Johan. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, Go ahead. 
I would like to support planned cuttlefish. Planned, excuse me, planned dolphin. I do not support planned cuttlefish. Planned dolphin has no fatal flaws. The geographic integrity of local communities of interest are respected in a manner that minimizes their division. <clears throat> planned dolphin reflects a consensus. Not every neighborhood boundary is perfectly intact, but all local communities of interest are kept whole. No local community of interest is put at a disadvantage. Planned cuttlefish has a fatal flaw. District D disregards criteria number four of the elections code. It says, districts shall be drawn to encourage geographical compactness in a manner that nearby areas of population are not bypassed in favor of more distant populations. District D in Planned Cuttlefish combines the working class neighborhoods of the Del Monte Boulevard in the North Fremont areas with a geographically distinct wealthier hillside neighborhoods, which have no common interests. Planned Cuttlefish could very well disenfranchise the working class and minority populations in the Del Monte and North Fremont neighborhoods. The wealthier hillside neighborhoods are not geographically nor socially connected to the working class neighborhoods on the flats. Of more concern to me is Planned Cuttlefish could very well allow the power of the wealthier neighborhoods to circumvent the recent legal opinion directing the airport to consider a second access road on the north side of the airport and to redo its proposal to use airport drive as a sole access point for airport business traffic. This is something to consider. The redistricting process says we have to consider the community of interests and the issues that will be presented before the city council. Planned Cuttlefish has a fatal flaw in this aspect. District D is a fatal flaw. It divides communities of interest and it disenfranchises the working class people on the flats by combining them with the wealthier neighborhoods on the hillsides. We have no commonality except for being in Monterey. Please approve Plan Dolphin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And Jill Johnson. Please unmute and go ahead. Hi, my name is Jill Johnson and I live in Monterey um, since 2003 on 107 Encina Avenue, which is right in the Del Monte, uh, Via Del Monte neighborhood. And um, frankly, the whole map options were um, quite confusing and artistic, mm -hmm. I must say. Um, how I narrowed it down just based on a feeling of community, not whether someone's wealthy or someone's um, disenfranchised or franchise, all these terms I'm hearing. Um, I looked at it as how can my sense of community or our community's sense of being be expressed? Um, I felt that there were two options. Um, and I decided that um, the abalone plan and the bat ray plan were the most, um, the most appropriate in terms of uh, geographical boundaries and um, social boundaries, like what parks do we use, what schools our kids go to, um, what drugstore we go to, you know, things like that that matter really in, in everyday life to some of us that um, don't have a lot of time to think about other concerns. So I would have to pick I really felt the bat ray. Um, I just couldn't get what was up with District C and bat ray. I thought that was pretty weird. Mm -hmm. So to me, the, the abalone plan um, seemed to be the best compromise. And I haven't heard anyone express that, but it does have that really nice shoot off into the bay. So perhaps, you know, the, the mammals and things like that are included. Um, I'm not really understanding why it has that big shoot off into the bay unless it includes the pier which there are several good restaurants there so that's good um but seriously um big decision difficult decision and as a resident and a person living in the more blue collar area of monterey and most of my neighbors are renters and many of these people i work with at community hospital um, my kid goes to school with their kids um i feel like the best option and it's not perfect but the best option would be the abalone option. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. 
All right, thank you. And next we have Alan and Sharon. Alan and Sharon, could you please unmute yourself? Okay, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, please go ahead. Okay, so Alan and Sharon's residents of Monterey, and uh, we um, would support uh, Plan D, Dolphin. Um, and from our perspective, uh, where we live, it would provide an uh, neighborhoods of common interest, uh, Kona, Via Del Monte, Del Monte Grove, Del Monte Beach, Oak Grove. Um, and we have, you know, uh, most have particular uh, interests, uh, fairgrounds, airport issues, uh, uh, parking, uh, things of that sort. So it's a, from our perspective, we can see that that plan would help us have a community of interest uh, together. So uh, plan, uh, plan D Dolphin is what we would support. Thank you very much. Um, next we have Carol Chormajian. Hi, good evening, um, uh, Mayor, City Council. My name is Carol Chormajian. I am a uh, Monterey resident. And um, I would repeat with some of the other speakers, um, D, Dolphin, um, it is. It, it, the map, to my estimation, does do the best job of keeping the neighborhoods um, and the communities of interest intact. And as well, if we're looking and doing sequencing, I think it would be important when you look at the at the population there where you would have and see where there hasn't been a um, uh, council person ever elected, it would be a good opportunity in the minority population to do that in a presidential year in 24, when it would be, you would have a higher turnout. Um, other than that, I agree with a lot of the other speakers, D, definitely D, Dolphin. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. And next, Lindsay Knight, please. Hi, good evening, Lindsay Knight, um, local resident of Monterey County, born and raised, current renter over by the aquarium, previous renter over by Ms. And I feel that it's really important that the community of interest that I'm advocating on behalf of is renters like myself, like my friends, like my colleagues, like many working folk that are in their 20s, 30s, and who are trying to build a life and build a future for themselves here. Well, the renters share the biggest common issue, and that is the affordability of rent here. We can't afford to own. It's out of our reach. It's not realistic to the vast majority. And that's why the vast majority of our county are renters. And that's why I'm in favor of the abalone map where the renters are best represented and have the majority stakeholder in at least two out of the four, um, four of those districts. And where, where we hold that vast majority allows us to vote in someone who represents our best interests. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. And next we have Richard Russello. Good evening, Mayor Clyde and Monterey City Council. Speaking, uh, Richard Rossello is president of the Casanova Oak Knoll Neighborhood Association. I'm going to speak to uh, Plan Dolphin with a couple new bits of information. Um, this area is contiguous. It's easily accessible. Uh, the other plans aren't. Uh, we also have the highest minority population in the city under this plan, but less than that on the voting age, which will change day by day as people age and children get to voting age. It's going to be a different demographic. But from what I see on the chart on, on the voting timing, 2024 presidential election will give us the largest turnout 
And I believe uh, District C should be scheduled for that time frame of 2024. And we'll get our best chance on getting a representative from this area. The, the commonalities not mentioned, which are extremely important, are that we have high percentage of renters. We have a good mix of homeowners. All the communities in this district have impacts from commercial properties, heavy traffic, and lots of spillover traffic from the fairgrounds. We also endure the airport. We have these common interests. No one who has ever lived in this area has been on the Monterey City Council. So our best shot is 2024 in Plan D, Dolphin. Urge you to adopt that plan. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Richard. All right, and next, Luis Osorio. Luis, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council, Luis Osorio. Mm -hmm. um, I have heard just about a different definition of a, communi of a community of interest um, from just about everyone that has spoken. And obviously that is the big issue here. Uh, for the city council. I, I think every map has uh, its pros and cons in terms of what those different definitions of community of interests are. Um, I think you're gonna have to make a very hard decision and the one factor that you, I think, need to keep close to how you make that decision is beyond all definitions and physical boundaries, you know, what is the community within the city that has been least uh, favored by historical decisions by different city councils within the city? By that, I mean that most decisions historically about just about anything have favored the property owners. That is very clear. Um, and, you know, some folks keep bringing up this issue that they have had no representation ever in the city council. Their areas haven't had. And it's, it's, it's very simple. Nobody from those areas ever ran for council, for office. So, and the, 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 the neighborhood, the Casanova Oak uh, node, they, they have fought tooth and nail every time that a project for renters comes up in the North Fremont area. And that the last project that was approved, I, you know, they, they fought for five years. And so clearly their interests are not those of the renters. And if you ask me, I, I will suggest that you need to adopt the Abalone map because they will at least give a chance of one renter to, to ever get elected and to truly represent the um, interest of the renting community. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Okay, next we have Marianne Boylan. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to address. Um, without repeating all of the sent sentiments mm -hmm. that uh, Jill Johnson and Lindsay Knight I have to agree with their reasoning and with Mr. Osorio who just spoke. I'm a homeowner, but rent and affordable renting is very important to me. And I believe the abalone better re represents these renters at 64% and the blue collar as um, I believe Lindsay mentioned. So uh, for my purpose, I strongly recommend you to go with the abalone. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you, Marianne. Okay, next we have Piper Loomis. Oh, hi, it's actually Elena Loomis. Oh, okay. um, that's okay, Mike. The, that's what the um, computer says. You're right. Uh, so um, I, my name's Elena Loomis, and I'm a longtime Monterey resident of 37 years. Um, for most of that time, I've been, we've been a homeowner. We were fortunate to move here when that was a possibility for a young family with uh, a baby and a two and a half year old. I, I think if I were moving here fresh, Again, um, with one income of a, my husband was a teacher at the time, I seriously doubt we would be able to purchase a home um, in Monterey or maybe even anywhere on the peninsula. So I believe it's time to give renters a strong voice. They are the folks that are uh, essential workers from nurses, teachers, uh, folks working in grocery stores and other restaurants, um, the aquarium, everywhere here depends on supporting our, our, our working folks. Um, so I am calling to support Plan Abalone. I believe it does the best job, not only of um, giving the chance of a renter being elected, but also possibly um, a, a Latino or Latina um, as a, a class that is also under and not represented in Monterey. So again, I would support Plan Abalone. Thank you for your time and thank you for your hard work. Uh, thank you, Elena. You're welcome. And there's one more hand raised that is Nancy Soule. Nancy, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Nancy Soule. I live in Old Town and I'm calling regarding the, um, hold on, I'm getting, I'm getting feedback here. Are you, are you getting me on the Zoom or my phone? There's a little bit of an echo, Nancy, but we can't understand. Okay, okay I'm going to, I'm going to cancel my phone. That's I'm excellent now, up. thanks, got it. Okay, sorry. Um, I'm Sorry. calling regarding in Old Town that the, a few of the proposals had boundaries on Madison Street and Sino Street. And I know it was addressed that some of that is due to census tracts, but if mm -hmm. census tracts does not prohibit it, I would like to request that whenever a boundary might be on Madison or Sino, that both sides of the street are kept intact. In that case, both those streets uh, bound, are backed by non-residents. They have the Monterey High School on one side, on Madison, and beyond Sino is the Lower Presidio. In both sites, in both streets, there are also the common issues that affect the neighboring adjacent streets, since both are feeder streets for a neighborhood school. On Sino and Madison streets, common issues typically arise with drop-offs and cars that idle, while waiting to access the entrance to the school. There's congestion to traffic on neighboring streets and parking. Sino is also the access and drop-off point for Bayview Academy and has the additional neighborhood issues of maintenance and public access to Larkin Park adjacent and used by the school. The boundary in whichever scenario is chosen needs to include both sides of this street on Madison and Sino so that issues that arise can continue to be resolved together with the other states that these decisions affect. Thank you for con your consideration. Thank you, Nancy. And we've got John Sovereign with his hand raised. Um, John, please go ahead. The council already knows how I feel about this whole process. Yes, uh, we do, John. <laughs> And I would just ask one thing as you go forward with the final map, um, you know, in the interest of transparency, I would suggest that the final map show the um, current residences of all the city council members and any rental property investments that they own or have an ownership interest in the city of Monterey. Thank you. Thanks, John. I didn't know you were gonna talk. <laughs> <laughs> And Esther Malkin. Good evening, everybody. Esther Malkin, Monterey County Renters United. 
Um, I find this whole process so interesting because like this last person just said, um, four out of the five of our council members are rental property owners, yet they get to decide what happens to the majority of the residents in the city's election process. So I wanna point out that um, I am a Cuban American. So I am one of the double community of interests speaking tonight. Um, and I wanted to point out that the argument that presidential elections are always uh, have a higher turnout, that's always the case, that's nothing new. And that shouldn't be factored into the sequencing. What should be is that we haven't had any representation from the working class neighborhoods. But I'd also like to point out that the majority of our minorities in this city happen to be renters because traditionally minorities cannot afford home ownership, especially in the current market. So if we are truly going to be representing and discussing and making these, these, these changes, for those people to be represented, we have to keep in mind that that is the case. And I think that the Apolloni map is the one that represents us most and is how we really, if we're going to do this for the right reasons, we need to represent those communities of interest. I will like to point out as well that those that started this process before LULAC got involved happen to live in the wealthy neighborhoods. So it is completely ironic that people from Fish Flats and Alta Mesa are the ones that are pushing this as some sort of social justice issue when it's really not a social justice issue to them. They are very involved in City Hall and have been and have been calling the shots and are very involved with our current council members. And they, but they are furious that the renter conversation has hijacked this whole conversation because they wanted it to be more about their neighborhoods being able to get somebody on these councils, not the underrepresented ones. So um, it is really important for us to stick to the original meaning of the reason why we are doing this. And that map that is going to achieve that is the Abalone map. And it is the truest one to the California Voters' Rights Act. That is what is at the heart of this whole situation that we've been put in by people who are not Latinos, not well, or renters. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. And next, Jason Reed, please. I'm Jason Reed, uh, live in Old Town, where I own a home. Uh, the speakers before me, including Luis, Marianne, and Esther, have spoken eloquently to the points that I would have made. Uh, I'm strongly in favor of the Abalone uh, plan and recommend the council adopt that. I'm particularly intrigued by John's suggestion that the council members, residents, and property ownership, rental property ownership, be identified uh, as part of this process of adoption of the maps. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. And next, Pat Venza. Mayor and city council members, um, I get hooked up on the principal and I know of things and I know I sent you a email concerning that, um, that this was brought on to us by LULAC. And um, it seems to me that the map that needs to be approved needs to show the highest protected class um, would be represented the most. And I find it interesting that people are suggesting A when, or abalone, when in fact that map spreads the Latino community, community pretty evenly across the city versus B, which puts um, the Latino community at 90, 29% in one area, cuttlefish 28 in one area and D 29 in one area. So 
uh, it seems to me that LULAC wouldn't be terribly happy with A. And of course, it bothers me that LULAC has not stepped up to the podium <laughs> to um, tell us how they feel about um, what we're doing and what they're advising since they're the ones who dropped this in our laps. Um, it's a hard decision. I was happy with it the way it was. Uh, I know we're being forced into this and um, I'm not sure what the right decision is, but um, if it's based on what LULAC is looking for, it seems to me that A is not the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. And Mayor, there are no more hands raised at this time. Okay, well, we wanna thank everybody for their input. Yeah, it probably made our decision even more complex because everyone was very articulate, had excellent reasons for what they supported. I, I appreciate that very much. Everyone on a nice professional level, I, I thank you for that as well. Let's come back at, 8.45, which would be a 10 minute break, please. And then we'll roll up our sleeves and find out uh, if the uh, harbor seals and the sea lions are, are going to be voters in the city since they're included in our maps. So we'll see you in 10, please. We'll take a brief recess.
everyone from our break. Again, I close the public hearing with respect to which maps uh, people preferred. And once the council decides on giving direction for the map with the council's approval, I think it would be fair to open up a comment. Maybe let's go two minutes on what uh, if people have any more input on sequencing. We did have two or three people already who spoke on sequencing, but I wanted to give a chance to anyone who uh, wanted to to speak on sequencing. So if that sounds good, we'll do that after we uh, decide where we're going on maps. Were there any questions as a result of um, public comment? Or are we ready to just roll up our sleeves? Anyone have uh, want to jump in and tell us what you're thinking, what your preference is? Um, you Mayor, can make I have a motion and, and see if we have uh, support. Mayor, I have a question on a couple of the maps, so at least one map for a staff. OK, start us off. Um, on the dolphin map, um, does that include uh, the Monsalis Monterey Woods area? Uh, that's on the other side of 68. That's one question. And is that is that part is that part of the Oak Knoll neighborhood, or is it part of um, Deer Flats neighborhood? Good question. Uh, so for the Dolphin map, uh, District D, I'll share I'll share the screen so that you can all see. Uh, Give me one second, share screen. I think I've got the right one. So um, you'll see here, we'll just focus on the, the eastern side of this district. This is the Dolphin Plan. District C has Oak Grove uh, and, and Kona and Via Del Monte together. Monsalis is right here in, in this uh, neighborhood just south of Santa Catalina School. That's in the D district, the purple district here. So then uh, Cuttlefish is the, is that the, the district, the map that Includes uh, Monsalis in in um, Oak Knoll. That's correct. Uh, okay. The cuttlefish plan has uh, Oak Grove is is part of a separate district. So uh, the cuttlefish plan has Monsalis and uh, Deer Flats and Fish Flats together with Kona and uh, Via Del Monte. Okay, thank you. That was the only question I had. Nick. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd, I'd like to ask a question of uh, Liz, not to put you on the spot, but redistricting partners. As I was listening to the public testimony and, and lots of good arguments for every map. Now, I'm, I'm, you were tasked to creating maps that met the California Voting Rights Act. So all four of them would meet the criteria that you presented to us. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't have done your job. Yes, no, and... Uh, Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's what I wanted to reemphasize is because we had lots of people talking about uh, the renter percentages, the highest ratio of Latinos, renters, socioeconomic common interests. And so I, I just wanted to reassure everyone that all four maps meet the spirit of the California Voters Right Act. Otherwise, we wouldn't be considering them. And again, there's nothing's perfect. All right, uh, questions, comments, motions? Uh, so just uh, maybe we just kick this off and I'll make a motion. And then of course, I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion. And I'll give my reasons after I, we get to hear from everybody. I'll make a motion that we, um, we move forward in uh, adopting as uh, Dolphin as the model for districts A, B, C, and D, but the Dolphin uh, skew. And I think that I'll say it, maybe it's going to need to be a second motion, but uh, in terms of the sequencing, do you want that in a second motion? Mary? I think we should do that separately. Yes. Yeah. All right. So uh, I'll make the motion that we, um, that we move forward with Dolphin as a first reading. I'll second. Okay. We have a motion and a second with the understanding if our different motions fail, nobody's feelings are going to get hurt. It's probably the easiest way to do it is just count noses and get on with it <laughs> because every one of them is, is defensible and every one of them um, is something I think uh, are, are obviously professionally done. Um, discussion, please. Yeah, so so can I, uh, Alan, if you- Oh yeah, well, I just, Council Member Ed, you want to, I'm sorry, Alan, if it's okay with you, Ed could explain yeah, why he just, made I that just motion. Wanna... I want to give it a couple of quick uh, bullet yeah. points of, of why. That's our normal protocols, yeah. Yeah, and, and um, 
it's 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 a tough call. I mean, there's there's a lot of um, information here, a, a lot of um, nuances, and for me, at the end of the day, I've got to wake up and say, well, what really is a community of interest? Where are the kinds of places that we go and we see our neighbors? We go to church, we shop, we travel, we use the parks, we do recreations, and those are the kind of things that I I look for. Um, Number one, I, I acknowledge that the um, diversity of our community is it's it's all over the place, and we have a lot of places that uh, are combined with owner owner op, or owner property properties that are owned and occupied by the owners, and then we have uh, renters as well. Um, Dolphin, I lean towards because um, the majority of skyline stays intact. And I really don't see any validity in removing Oak Grove from the beach track, Kona, and both sides of Fremont. So I, I lean towards looking at everything that is Oak Grove East as highly rich in commonalities of transportation, of activities, uh, and by nature, a lot of renters, but also uh, a wide number of, um, of the diversity. And it's also the highest percentage uh, when you look at C, Dolphin C, it's 29.8% uh, um, in terms of minority on the east side. So I'm looking at overall not cutting and not separating significant neighborhoods. And in Dolphin, I also like the fact that nearly all of New Monterey is still intact as well. And, and I'll leave it there. There's a few other things if I drill down, but th those were the predominant points. Thank you, Council Member Allen. <clears throat> uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I guess I think it would have been probably better and more helpful if we had all sort of shared our comments before we jumped into a motion. Because as it stands, I think we're unlikely now to get a unanimous um, vote. And I think that's unfortunate. Um, but let me explain my rationale for why I don't support Dolphin, um, why I favor the um, abalone. So um, first of all, I think when you look at Dolphin, the District D is really not a contiguous, um, concentrated, sort of rational district. You have, I guess I would challenge anyone to walk that district, you know, all the way from Ryan Ranch to the, um, you know, long Highway 68 to, to all the way down to the harbor, essentially. Um, so I don't think that it's a contiguous, geographically meaningful district. Um, and then when you look at its social identity, it combines the working class neighborhoods of the downtown with um, Alta Mesa and um, Deer Flats, Fisherman Flats. Um, I think that it really doesn't look like a district that makes a whole lot of sense to me. Um, the other, I guess for me, the reason why I really favor the abalone is I think that it does more logically divide up um, the city into communities of interest in general. I think it creates four sort of geographically uh, justifiable and rational and walkable districts. Secondly, when we look at the feedback we received, um, we got, first of all, we represent everybody, um, love and respect all of the citizens of Monterey. But it seems to me that as I'm listening and looking at the feedback, I'm seeing feedback from the business community and really primarily from one neighborhood, Casanova Oak Knolls in favor of Dolphin. When I'm looking at the feedback for Abalone, which was you know, equal in number, maybe even a little bit more, I'm not sure. 
it really is more representative of the renter population, the diversity of our city. Um, several of the speakers are from the Latinx community. Many of them are from the renter community, which is two thirds of our community and is not represented on the council. And the Abalone plan, I think, is the best plan for giving representation to the renter community, which is a real community of interest. We've seen their interest in things like rent control. We've seen their interest in things like rental assistance. We've seen that community's interest in things like affordable housing, which are really not aligned with some of the other communities. Um, and the Abalone creates two districts, which um, give strong representation to the runner population, where the runner population and community will have a real chance to elect a couple of people to the council, uh, which they deserve, considering that they're two thirds of the city population. So um, I favored the Abalone. I wish we would have had a little more conversation because. Uh, I'm not going to be able to vote for the motion. Okay, well, this is why we're having the discussion now, but thank you for your input. All right, uh, anyone else? Uh, Council Member Dan? Okay, thank you. Um, well, let, I'm going to start uh, first by saying that, um, you know, I, I, I'm concerned about going to districting in the city of Monterey anyway. We keep our city together as a one unit and i'm hoping mm -hmm. that going to districts that uh, all four districts will be able to work together and uh, make sure the city remains the the best city in the state of california and i'm and i know they have to you have to work together in order to do that and we've done such a great job over the years that i'm hoping that that will continue and i'm going to stay positive on that and uh say that uh it, it will happen because we do have great residents. So I first want to start with uh, the the two that I don't think uh, work uh, for the best for the city of Monterey. Uh, the first one is Bat Ray. Um, I, I I'm only going to say this on as one part, and that is uh, New Monterey and Lighthouse and uh, Cannery Row. When it splits that neighborhood, to me, it's always been um, one continuous. Uh, part of our city. And so for me, I, I would not like to see that area um, split up. Then the, um, the second uh, one is uh, cuttlefish and uh, or, um, yeah, cuttlefish. To me, um, the, the reason that I, um, you, by the way, all these maps are, all these maps uh, have put a lot of time in and, and we're really kind of, um, splitting hairs on a lot of them. But for this one, I, I really see Oak Grove um, and uh, that area uh, on the same uh, same plane as uh, you know Del Monte Grove and, and Oak Knoll. And, and I think that that should be a part of, of our community or at least their community. So I, I don't know if, if cuttlefish works for me. So getting to Dolphin and Abalone, um, really to me, the, the only two differences between them is the dividing line between Del Monte Grove and, and Oak Knoll. Uh, obviously, that's for obvious uh, to me. Um, and trading off downtown or moving downtown's um, uh, rentals um, or rental population, uh, there's quite a few rental population uh, in Oak Knoll, uh, which is on the, um, on the east side. So, uh, to me, I, I still see, as a, a longtime resident of, a resident of Monterey, I see those two neighborhoods working very well together um, because of the, the working relationship they've had in the past. And I, I'd hate to see in a district uh, those two neighborhoods split up. That's, uh, that's one of the, the big reasons why um, I felt uh, that uh, Abalone or Dolphin uh, works better. Uh, for the city of Monterey. But one thing I do want to say that um, it is exciting that one portion of our city will have a representative on our council that they've never had before. And I think that's uh, that's very important and that's a very 
positive outlook for um, for our city. So that's my comments. Thank you, Councilmember Dan. Councilmember Tyler, I think you had your hand raised. Yeah, I um, uh, I I think a learning lesson for all of us, um, and, and I think much credit due to to Esther actually was um, the identification of the rental community being a community of interest um, in the city. And, and if I recall correctly, I think I even remember Liz mentioning at a certain point that it was not something that they had previously encountered before. So even in the industry that they're working in, it was kind of maybe a little bit of a light bulb moment. I don't wanna speak for them, but um, it, it, it definitely was in, enlightening to, um, to hear this information. And I think for us to make decision that is not in the best interest of the majority of our residents, I think um, would be a little bit disingenuous. And so I, I'm, I, I also just wanna pause for a second and say that I, I agree with Alan that it's, it's actually a little bit frustrating that we kind of jumped right into a motion. Um, I mean, from the three years that I've been on the council, we usually have a discussion first amongst each other and it just kind of seems odd that there was just a motion made pretty soon into um, after public comment. So I'm just going to let that be what it is. Um, we're here now, and 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 again, it, it is difficult to support this at this point because we haven't given ourselves much of a of a conversation um, before the motion was made. But I think the reason why um, the renter issue is so important. Um, this isn't just something specific to the city of Monterey. This is something that we're seeing across the state. You can consider housing uh, probably our biggest issue. Um, and when we talk about uh, the, the renter population, these are the folks that are likely to be on the edge of ending up homeless. And this is a discussion that we had earlier in the afternoon session. So this is something that's very live and with us. Um, and I think again, for us to not to, con to consider that uh, the point was made earlier that 16.9% um, of the CVAC, the Latino uh, Latino CVAC, was um, in the Dolphin district. Um, but I think when we incorporate that data to include um, the renter data that was provided earlier, I think that the abalone map really does provide space for us to have two solid districts that support the renter community. And so just doing a comparison for district C in the abalone map, it gives 80.1% um, of a rent, 80.1% uh, renters. And in the dolphin map, it gives 75.7. So that five, four percent right there could make a, a difference in an election and really allowing the renter community to have their voice be heard in a way that it hasn't been traditionally. And we know that they tend not to vote at the same proportions that homeowners do. So that, that greater amount can really um, make a difference. And then when we look at the map, um, it's not only downtown, um, but it's also the lower part of my community in Old Town. And when we look at Old Town as a neighborhood association, um, it's those few bottom streets at the bottom of downtown that are the most dense. So it's all of that lower part of uh, Old Town, it's all of downtown, um, and, and you're mixing that with a pretty affluent part of the community. So I have concerns with this map. Um, um, I, I also think it's relevant to the, the point that I think Jason um, Reed had made a comment earlier. I think it would be interesting and I'm not, I'm not sure how relevant it's gonna be towards our decision today, um, but I still think it would be helpful to, to see a map of where the uh, council members live um, and properties owned by council members just to kind of give a perspective um, and be transparent with the public around um, kind of where we where our, our interests may lie. So I'll I'll end it there and I'm interested in hearing other thoughts. Um, Mayor, may I come back with a just a couple of uh, additional 
Yes, please, Council okay. Member Ed. Uh -huh. yeah, and I and I do uh, I do definitely want to have the discussion with my fellow council members by making a motion. It does not mean that uh, we shouldn't still have an effective um, dialogue about this. So there's there's too much data to go through to you know to rush this. And by no means am I trying to rush this. Um, there was a caller, well, a couple of callers, and they asked about identification of council members. But I thought that that was one of the rules that. Uh, Nat, you can answer this, that um, the mapographers were not allowed to have the location of the council members in, their, correct. Their, in their data. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. uh, So I think any member of the public that would desire to know where their council members live, it wouldn't take very much to determine that with probably uh, a, a view of the, the election records that we had. We probably all have our addresses in our forms. Um, but I'll disclose here because some folks wanted to know, I don't own any rentals. I've been in my home on Pacific Street for 39 years. And uh, I mean, a lot of people know where I live. So I <laughs> see folks driving by all the time and, and uh, pretty regularly wave when I'm working in the yard, but I don't own any rentals in the city of Monterey, uh, nor have I ever. <clears throat> so I just wanted to get that out there. Let me go back to the data. Um, one of the things that I, you know, I, I needed to find something that were my high value marks. What was I most interested in accomplishing uh, this very tedious work and trying to land on a couple of different models that worked? And I just have a hard time envisioning, as an example, under um, Abalone, that would take a street such as Fremont, a North Fremont and divide it where we would have uh, a pockets of, so one side of the street and the neighborhood would be represented by one district and the other would be represented. So I was leaning towards acknowledging that we do have a lot of rentals on the east side of town. And that's why I leaned towards Dolphin because it kept intact Casanova Oak Knoll, which goes all the way up Casanova with a lot of renters, also goes on both sides of Fremont and goes into the, the beach track as well and goes all the way down to include the Navy Postgraduate School, although there's not a lot of residents there, but Oak Grove was included. So looking at where the renters are, I think um, the abalone doesn't give me that because it actually divides uh, North Fremont. And I wanted to see uh, that area, that east side of town, uh, stay intact, and that was that was one of the strong driving factors that I had uh, un under the under the uh, Abalone um, District D uh, would be hard to walk as well. Uh, Alan, I think you mentioned that. You know, that was one of your factors that you were interested in is, you know, the continuous and the compactness of, of beats. But unfortunately, with the populations of the way things are broken out, um, in Abalone, um, District D is kind of really spread out all over the place. And in Dolphin, um, it has also D as well as kind of spread out as well. So I don't know that there's any perfect walkable kind of a district, except for maybe New Monterey. So that, that was almost an impossible factor to land on. So I just wanted to make some of those points. Okay, council member Dan, then we'll go to council member Tyler. Thank you, Ed. Thanks for bringing that up about uh, Fremont Street because the same thing that you were mentioning, I was mentioning about Lighthouse is that um, they not only does Cannery Row and New Monterey have a, a special interest, and that is in Lighthouse because of traffic issues, because of businesses, and, and they, they have the, that particular impact. It's the same thing with those two neighborhoods when it comes to North Fremont Street, is they have the same impacts. They have something in common, and uh, that is a business district. And so to split those two neighborhoods, um, at least with two council members, to me, it would be better to have one council member representing um, that particular business area along with the two neighborhoods that close together. 
All right, Council Member Tyler, please. Yeah, I just wanted to um, jump back to the request that was made earlier in public comment and, and Ed had just responded to. I think the idea of putting it on a map wasn't about the demographers using it to determine the district boundaries, which I think is why they, they're not supposed to know where we live. But I'm talking about now at this point, I think it's something that it's relevant. And I'm not saying for the demographers to do, I'm saying for maybe our city staff to put that together. And yes, that information can be made available to the public, but I'm saying that we can make it accessible to them. So let's make it easy for them to be able to see that data instead of having them to have to do all the research, which might be a little bit difficult for folks that may not be as familiar or comfortable with being able to request that kind of information. Um, I, one thing too that, that I really looked at when um, there was the, the heat map that showed where renters were in the city. One thing that's really interesting when you look at that map is as you get closer to the coast, you, you tend to see more renter communities. And as you get away from the coast and you go inland, um, you know, you go up into the hills in New Monterey or Old Town, or you go up into the hills or into the woods um, in the interior of the city, you tend to have more homeowners. So it's just a kind of a general observation that I made. And I think that's one of the reasons why I like the abalone map, because it kind of creates two solid districts that go along the coast that's heavily renter that has the, the, the shared interest. And then when you go inland, generally speaking, you have more home ownership. And so I think kind of creating that, um, that, that kind of model where you have just two districts on the coast. One thing that Paul brought up at the last council meeting is that you wanna avoid kind of mixing um, uh, wealthier communities with uh, communities that aren't so wealthy. And I feel like the, um, the uh, dolphin map does that to a certain extent by, by going from coast to inland, right? So you take lower parts of Old Town, downtown, right? And you plug them in with Alta Mesa, which is probably one of the more, uh, uh, affluent parts of, of our community. So I think it's really nice to kind of keep that renter block together. And I just kind of wanted to speak to that a little bit more. Um, and then, you know, the last thing I would say, since we're throwing out motions here, I would like to make a substitute motion for the abalone map. I'll second that motion. Okay, we have a substitute motion. And can I go back to, um... Tyler's comment on yeah. uh, renter blocks is, can we put on the map um, what the renter percentage is in Oak Knoll? I'd, I'd like to see that. Uh, I, I don't remember, I didn't write it down. So is there a way, Nat, that you could put that on? I, I'd like to see that percentage. Sure, uh, specifically you said- uh, Oak Knoll area. Yeah. Yeah. Casanova, Oak Knoll. Yes, Casanova, Oak Knoll. We could do that, hang on one minute. While he's pulling that up, I can tell you it's 68%. Oh, ah, then you already um, have it. But so it, it is a high percentage, but what happens is when you when you take out um, Casa, Casanova, Oak Knoll, um, when you go to the abalone map, when you switch from the abalone map to the uh, dolphin map, you remove, and um, now it might help if you kind of draw your cursor over like downtown um, where it's 82%. And then right next to that, to the left, it says 97% going into Old Town. These are higher percentages of renter communities. Um, so yeah, Kona does have a higher percentage than homeowners, but look what we're taking out in order to replace it with. Let's see, so what you're saying, Tyler, is that there's a higher percentage of renters downtown, a lower part of, New, of Old Town, um, then, then in Kona, is that is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Okay. And 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 the maps that they showed earlier um, showed that. So when you have District C on the abalone map, it gives you 80.1 percent of a renter district, and on the dolphin map, it gives you 75.7 percent. 
Yeah, I'm getting a headache. Um, <laughs> now, if, I think, I, if I, if I, I just I think, make clarify. I, I think that the percentage is higher only because there's not as many um, homeowners down in the, the yeah. town area. So that, yeah. that can skew the numbers, Tyler. I mean, yeah. you've got more uh, R3 property. Yeah, yeah I, that skews it. Uh, I, just I, I, I will ask our city manager to jump in. Yeah. I just want to throw this in. Uh, yes, uh, the the percentages are based on 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 the no, uh, on uh, numbers uh, of of folks that rented. It doesn't mean necessarily that uh, it's representative necessarily of the number of housing units you have there. So if you take a look at at at, at the map uh, at the heat map that you had on, you had a outlier of 100% renters down to the right hand side, you know, that might be just one rental property in, in, a, in a green belt. So so keep please that in mind as well. And when you look at the maps, uh, it, it helps sometimes to drill down and, and see at the number of apartment buildings that you can also then identify. And, and when you look at Casanova Oak Knoll, a right hand side, towards Delray Oaks, you have a, quite a number of, of apartment yeah. buildings mm -hmm. that um, that probably help to, to bring the numbers up to 68%. So again, percentage numbers are, are relative, but they are a good indication as well. And there's right. a number Council of Member uh, Allen? rental buildings in the lower part of Old Town too. Council Member Allen? Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, so I think, yeah, there's, there's two ways of looking at the shift between C and D, between Dolphin and Abalone. Um, one, I think Tyler's pointing out, which is that by moving the downtown and the lower Old Town into C, you're really disenfranchising a lot of, a lot of folks living in that high density area who are in all likelihood not going to be represented by someone from there. They're, more than likely going to be represented from somebody in the wealthier um, part of that district. And, um, and at the same time, if you look at D, or if you look at, I guess, C in the Dolphin, you're taking people then out of, uh, in Abalone, they would have been part of that long coastal, that coastal high density, high renter district, which is really where they belong in terms of their community of interest. There's not a whole lot of similarity between the downtown and Deer Flats, Fisherman Flats, Alta Mesa. There's a lot more similarity and community of interest for the folks living there with the folks in Oak Grove and, uh, and Del Monte, Laguna Grande area. I also think that 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 area, why the um, Abalone creates a much more meaningful community of interest for that district is um, climate change is going to, and ocean level rise is going to be a huge issue in the coming decades. And it is predominantly going to affect the people in the downtown, in and around Laguna Grande, in and, in and around. Um, El Estero and, and all along what is um, a contiguous and unified district in Abalone, but is split up in Dolphin. Um, speaking to the Fremont issue, I, I don't think that is, I don't think Fremont might be a business district, but I don't think Fremont, it's, I think, let me put it this way. I think it's significant you have two different neighborhood associations on each side of Fremont. If that was really one community, I don't think that would be the case. And the fact is Kona, although it does have some um, apartment buildings, is really primarily a single family housing uh, area. Its primary interests are the fairgrounds and the airport. Those are the things when we hear from folks who live there, what are they concerned about? They're concerned about the airport. They're concerned about airport road. They're concerned about the fairgrounds and noise from the fairgrounds. And they also don't want to see a lot of high density uh, development there. They fought that consistently. On the other side, I don't, you, you don't hear about the fairgrounds. Um, you don't hear about the airport as much. Um, and you hear a lot more about affordable housing 
and, and, and those housing related issues. So I don't think, I, I think that the, the um, Del Monte Laguna Grande neighborhood is focused in a different direction, more towards the ocean, along the ocean. And I think the Avalone plan really better captures that community. Alan, um, I, I can agree with you on, on the point that it is con contiguous. I agree with that. However, though, I'm gonna go back with the, uh, the, the comment that you made about uh, a, a, a solid block of, of renters on the east side of, um, of Oak Knoll, and there's quite a few units there. I know it because I've walked that neighborhood that now they're in with, with uh, Fisherman's Flats, with, um, with other areas that are different, let's put it that way. And to me, I, I, I would see that neighborhood better fitting in with, um, Across Fremont than I do see downtown fitting in with that particular area, only because of the, the large block of renters that live in that part of the community. Yeah, and I think you could add to that the Del Monte Boulevard, the rec trail, the navigation that they are closer to the east side of town from the Oak Grove across Sloat. I mean, there's just a lot of commonality there. And actually, that's not only the only road that they connect to, but they connect on the, the actual Mark Thomas on the backside. So a, lo a lot of uh, locale connection from uh, Oak Grove, uh, the 10th Street, and then you get down and you take a left and you're down, you're down into uh, the Kona area rather rapidly. And so they are kind of connected there. So uh, that you know, and it's and it's hard because there's no perfect model here. Um, there's so many choices, but I just think uh, for me the connectedness between North Fremont and separating North Fremont and just thinking across the street, they all use North Fremont. They go to the same grocery store. They go to the the drug stores. They go to the, a variety of different commercial. Uh, activities and they're and they're up and down that street and to think that one side is one district and the other side is a completely other district just to me doesn't seem like it fits and and we did hear from folks that live out there and they basically said they, they don't want to be divided they want to be connected to both sides of North Fremont and so I just think that they have a lot of uh, common interests um, in, in keeping the east side of town intact uh, the other thing I was going to say is when I look at across all of these districts different districts in, in Dolphin. One of the goals is to look at um, all the districts are gonna have renters. All the districts will have minorities. All the districts will have traffic problems. All the districts will have basically the same kinds of issues. Yes, some are higher uh, value properties, but they all have renters. Um, so we can't, we can't rule it out and say, that one district is more renters than the other. Yeah, I think that you could look at the numbers and say, yeah, the east side of town is gonna to be more renters than uh, some of the skyline or uptown, but all of them have renters in some form or fashion, especially when you've got residences that are rented as well. And with the uh, on-call or the uh, oncoming with ADUs and modifications to our homes, we're seeing more and more renters among the traditional R1s that uh, we all have renters as our neighbors. You know, um, I, I was at an event the other day um, where the mayor made some remarks that I hope lived true, which was the fact of us going to districts and that regardless of the fact of us going to districts that all council members are going to, are going to represent the entire city. Absolutely. And I feel like that's true. I can say that. I'm, I'm hoping that can be true for all of my colleagues here. Um, my, my, my hope is that that can be true with whoever replaces us on the council. Um, but I can also recognize how different communities can create interest. And that's what happens with districts. And I think that's what some of the fear is that is associated with a lot of people with us going to districts in the first place. Yeah. Um, I think that's how Dan started the com his comments off earlier. So. Um, as much as I hope that's true, I, I think it's important for us to 
recognize the powers that are at play within the city. Um, we're all homeowners, every single one of us. There's not an opportunity that we've really created to change things to allow renters to step in and actually have some representation and allow them to choose the people of power. And so I well, think- don't you think we would be doing that with, with any one of these? Just let me, if you could just let me real quick uh, and then I'll let, let you jump in. Um, you, you made the point at, uh, just a second ago, that all districts will have renters. And that's absolutely true. All districts are going to have homeowners too. So even within that, that district, you're going to have a lot of different interest groups. But the whole point of us going to districts, the whole point of this is so that we can select that certain groups of our community can select their person to have representation. And ideally, hopefully we're using that for the greater good, for making Monterey better, for making Monterey have the opportunity to have representatives that don't traditionally have representation on the council. And I'm sorry, but it keeps, for me, it keeps coming back to the renter community. And there are, I mean, I'm thinking about the MISS students in the lower part of Old Town, right? Like there are segments of our community that we should be accepting. They live here, they're a part of our community that I don't think will be represented to Alan's point earlier. If you allow that kind of district to go um, from coast to inland, including communities like Alta Mesa, it will truly water down the, the, the renter vote and, and the influence that they have within the city. Um, I was just gonna uh, make a point that I think we were, we had an agreement point there, but that um, renters would have a powerful voice under Dolphin as well, because so much of their district would be primarily renters, Oak Grove, a lot of renters there, all the way down Del Monte, entirely everything on both sides of Fremont. And I think you said Kona was 60 something percent renters. It's a high percentage of renters, but they would have both sides of Fremont and a lot of rentals as well as down into Oak Grove. So again, military folks are renters and they're there, uh, but also there are a lot of other people who live in Oak Grove, uh, that would be part of the Dolphin District uh, C, I believe it is, if if that's the way the um, the motion went, because that would be a pr primarily renter centric uh, district, and so I think that they would have a voice. So I, I'm I'm saying that I agree that they will have a voice and they will have an opportunity under Dolphin. They're not being excluded. Okay, well, procedure-wise, we have a substitute motion. We would vote on that first. And that was uh, made by Tyler, Council Member Tyler, I believe, and seconded by Alan or vice versa for abalone, correct? So is there any more discussion on that? Well, Mayor, I would just throw out uh... I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. I think it might be helpful towards the conversation that, that we're all kind of contributing here and maybe having an opportunity to, to hash this out a little bit better. Well, sure. I agree with all of you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's complex. I, I, I've listened to you. And thank you, Tyler, for mentioning my remarks at the uh, Neighborhood Association, because I honestly believe that. Um, I struggle a little bit with a homeowner would have necessarily a different interest of, of the city of Monterey than a renter. Obviously, there's a, a difference. Um, I own a home because it was affordable when I bought my home 50 years ago. I'm a school teacher. I can't buy my host house today. So I think as a homeowner, do I have empathy for renters? Yes. Will I represent renters? Yes. One of our children is a renter. My granddaughter's going to, uh, my granddaughters are renters. And so I know what they're going through. One of them is going to be a renter in San Francisco at her college. So I, I 
I, I firmly believe to put a, the positive side, I think whoever is on this council, and I strongly believe it, whether they're a renter or a homeowner is going to do what's right for the entire city. If you look at the, our, our city, we have inclusionary housing. We have over 500 units. The inclusionary housing ordinance was passed in 1980. The city council members were homeowners and they put inclusionary housing ordinance in place. It wouldn't be there today. And so uh, I don't think we have to create conflict between homeowners and renters. And that would be my biggest hope. I would think whoever is on the council. And there's this uh, another myth that you have to be wealthy to run for city council. I would say you probably have to have time, not money, because the job compared to 40 years ago when I started is so much different, primarily because of the internet and social media. But a person can win a council seat citywide or in a district and doesn't have to be wealthy. Person does have to have time. Person has to be listening and a person has to represent whether it's a district or city at large. So I don't think I agree that you uh, wealthy homeowners get on the council and they do only uh, represent other wealthy homeowners. As a retired teacher, I know so many teachers in my neighborhood they were in a situation like I was, they were able to afford a house back in the day when it was affordable. I don't think they're the enemy. So let's uh, do roll call please on the substitute motion, which is choose abalone. Roll call please. Hey, council member uh, Williamson. Yes. Council member Smith. Uh, no. Council member Albert. No. Councilmember Hoffa? Yes. And Mayor Roberson? No. So the next roll call vote would be on the first motion, which was to adopt Dolphin. Did you have anything else you all wanted to say about that before we make another vote? You know, I just kind of chiming in on your last comments, Mayor. I don't think it's about pitting anybody as residents in our community against each other. I think it in in my eyes it's just all about trying to create the best opportunity for representation um and and you listed a litany of things that the city has done historically that has tried to address the housing issue and unfortunately those things maybe help chip away help us get you know somewhere but it hasn't solved the issue and, and i'm not saying that having better representation would solve it but i think having a stake in the game um giving voice to I think does a lot towards um, collaboration, towards you know hearing different perspectives, um, seeing somebody that looks like me or that has that experience like me can motivate and inspire folks to get and engage and involved in a way they traditionally haven't been. So um, you know it's disappointing to see the direction that this is going in, but I also respect the process and I and I, I appreciate everybody's uh, input in the conversation. Mayor, if I can make a comment also. Yes, please. Um, you know, in, in listening to the, the five of us, it, we're, we're sounding like, to me, we're sounding like we are making a decision that we're splitting our renters up and not making them a, a strong voice in our, in our community. But when you look at the two maps, as, as uh, Council Member Smith mentions, the, they're pretty strong voting block on, on both maps. So, I mean, I, I, Tyler, I respect what you're saying, but, but they're, they're gonna have a, a pretty good voice in either one of those yeah. maps, either one. So, yeah, uh, yeah no, and, and I was just trying to make that point earlier, right? Like that 4% four, 4 or whatever that is difference um, in, in more, venture, more renters in, in one district versus another district map, um, you know, that could make the difference in allowing that community to, to have their person. I understand that. I, I get that. Anyway, uh, that, Mayor, that's all, that's all a comment I need to make. Council Member Ed? Yeah, just uh, one final comment. Um, I, I do really appreciate everybody's um, work and thought in, in this. And we've all, we've all gone through this in the last, what, 45 days. And, and it yeah. hasn't been easy on any of us. And we know the public has been really paying attention and, and really appreciate 
uh, everybody who participated and called and has participated in all the past um, uh, public meetings. And um, I just want to say that we, we haven't talked much about um, after this is all done and we've done our final second reading, um, that our neighborhood improvement associations, we, we don't want to create any losers here. And I don't think that this does. It will require a little bit of, you know, figuring out where the lines are and figuring out, you know, your neighborhood association still should be intact. And you know what, it really puts the burden on the council because a council is gonna need to be able to go to the meetings and participate with everybody who's in that neighborhood association, irrespective of what district they may represent. So it, I see a lot of opportunities for any council member to participate in all the districts because all the districts have to be heard. And yes, at the vote time, when the signs go up and you're knocking on doors, your district is a little smaller, but we've got neighborhood associations that will cross district lines. And it's gonna be important to participate and uh, go to those neighborhood meetings and go to those picnics and go to those barbecues and really make sure that a council member is accessible to all the districts. And so I just wanted to point out that we have a fantastic model of uh, neighborhood associations that really bridge all gaps, that help us uh, fetter out the best way to represent the city of Monterey. Irrespective of districts, that's not gonna matter. We're gonna look at the best, what's best for the city of Monterey. And uh, every district will get represented by all four council members and an at-large mayor. I'm pretty confident in that. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Allen? Yeah, I, I was ready to vote, but since other folks are speaking, I guess I'll go ahead and <laughs> no, let's do it. <laughs> share my we thoughts. We wanted to have um, a deeper conversation. So for me, the the whole question about renter representation, again, it isn't really about hitting one group against another. I'm a home, homeowner, and, and just like you, Mayor, I certainly have empathy for, and I remember what it was like for most of my life to have been a renter. Um, so I do believe that's true. On the other hand, I think one of our obligations in drawing districts was to look at community of interest. There's no doubt in my mind, despite what a few speakers um, said, that renters are a community of interest. And while it's true, because they're literally 65% of the city, it would almost be impossible not to draw a map in which they wouldn't have some significant a significant voter population. But if you're not creating districts, ideally two, that have more than 65%, then you're really not advancing uh, that community. You're divide, by dividing that community up into areas or districts where maybe it's more like 50%, you're really downgrading their voting power, making it harder for them to get someone that they might feel represents them better. Whether they actually will be represented better or not, who knows? Time will tell. But um, so for me, that's why I think uh, we're going in the wrong direction and why I won't be supporting the motion. Okay, thank you so much. As we said, we respect everyone's viewpoint on on this and very articulately expressed i think roll call please the motion is uh, to adopt dolphin as the draft map yes council member smith yes council member albert yes council member williamson no council member hoffa no and mayor roberson yes the motion passes three to two all right now, if you think that was fun, let's talk about sequencing of the elections. Could we have the benefit of the chart that shows us the data again about the sequencing? Yes, it's something that uh, target, that would be excellent. Yeah, that might help. Yeah. And, uh, Leave you're, uh, we're looking at, um, let me share the screen here. This is uh, information on the voter turnout as uh, one of the potential considerations as council decides which uh, or how to sequence the elections. Here's 
the other slides that talk about um, the considerations that include protecting the ability of a protected class to elect candidates of his choice. Um, bottom line here is that uh, two districts need to be sequenced for November 2022 and then two for November 2024. So I've got a question. Yes, sir. go ahead. So um, two districts need to be selected for November 2022. Right. And my mind tells me that that's uh, automatic. So there's uh, two, two districts that would be under the proposed voted on Dolphin, which would be District A and District D, is that correct? If we opted to go with November, 2022 election, it's gotta be two districts and it would have to be those districts because the two council members that are currently in those districts are finishing their four year terms. Is that correct? It, it uh, to answer the question, it doesn't have to be, but that could be uh, one option for council. Council can choose to if if uh, it, it depends. Um, so if the goal is to have considered council member residency for the Dolphin map, uh, districts A and D would give the two incumbents an option to run for re-election in 2022. So districts A and D would be sequenced in 2022, and then B and C in. Uh, 2024. If council choose, council could choose another sequencing as well, but that would then either mean uh, that uh, uh, one or more council members would have to wait, would, would not be able to run for election in November 2022 and wait until November 2024. Right. So and could you, well, let me ask a question, maybe answer it later. Could you repeat what it was at LAFCO? had indicated was uh, one of their priorities in- the LULAC, in, right. Or LULAC, I'm sorry. The LULAC, I get them confused too. Yeah, the LULAC uh, from Salinas was uh, voicing uh, you know, a preference. Could you repeat that? Yeah, at least what uh, LULAC shared with me on Friday was that uh, they would see no reason to completely uh, throw, uh, throw things into chaos by forcing currently elected council members, uh, depriving them of an opportunity to run for re-election, essentially. So um, Andrew Sandoval expressed an interest in supporting uh, the sequencing that would allow incumbents to, to run for office uh, if, if, that, uh, if they, they choose to run for office. And on that note, I do wanna point out that District C has the highest Latino uh, CVAP population, so just shy of 17%. So if we do want to ensure that they have the highest uh, voter turnout, it would be during uh, the 2024 election, most likely. Okay. Let's, uh, we did indicate uh, earlier that uh, we would go out to the public uh, for another round of conversation if some folks want to, uh, two or three people already gave their preference, I believe, but if there are some people still participating who have a, a uh, want to comment on the sequencing, I'd like to open it up again. Let's go two minutes, it's getting late. If we can have input, for people and have a two minute time limit. I think it would be fair to hear from the public on this if that sounds good from the council before we bring it back. Okay, I see a lot of nodding heads. Let's do that then, Clementine. Certainly, and uh, the hands have been changing around here, but I see Esther Malkin. We are, the same people can speak again, correct? Yes, but this time we're talking about sequencing only, please. Yes, okay. Esther? Yes, hi. <clears throat> I'd like to point out that if we don't allow the districts that don't have council members seated already 
we are actually going to continue the status quo, which is not what we're trying to accomplish here. And by saying that the voter turnout is higher for Latinos in a presidential election, I will repeat what I said before, that is the case in every single voter demographic. Presidential elections always get more turnout. So what should be the deciding factor here is do we allow the status quo to continue in power for another two years while the communities of interest wait around for a presidential election that everybody is going to turn out more, not just them. So I have a real problem with putting more people in a seat in the seats that are going to be open from the same areas that the current council members are from already. And, you know, this isn't a matter of, of homeowners versus renters. This is more a, 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 an issue about pro property owners and rental owners versus renters and business owners that, that control the city council and have more influence in the city council. They always have, they have more influence. The, the wealthier neighborhoods have more influence in NCIP and renters are too busy working two and three jobs to pay the rent to show up at barbecues and meetings every five minutes. So this is why we have to have the districts that don't have representation have that representation as soon as possible. Thank you, Esther. All right, next, um, Mike Brassfield. Hi. Hello, Mike. Listening to, listening to what Esther just said, I, I don't think people think that way. Um, I don't like pitting citizens against each other or forming cliques in order to accomplish that. What I'm hoping to hear, and I've already heard from council members in there, your comments is that we're just trying to get through this process. In my mind, I don't care if you toss a coin, as was suggested, mm -hmm. or if we, you know, beat this thing to death and then toss a coin. I wish you luck. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And there are no more hands raised at this time. Oh, uh, Richard Rosello just joined. Hang on, All right. Richard. <clears throat> just in the nick of time. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening again. Uh, I'll give you an example on Dolphin. Uh, we have a high renter class, high minority area. We've never had a councilman from this district. In a presidential election, we'll get a taller vote. But to disagree with the previous caller, none of the incumbents will be running in District 6C under Dolphin because none of them live here. And unless they decided to move here, it's only going to be people from our district running. So I think that takes care of that. But the higher number always produces a better outcome we get a better candidate when er we encourage everybody to vote. The low elections, low turnout can be disasters. We've seen some of those in the past. And, and it's really disastrous if you only have one candidate. You really need to have a candidate against another candidate so that you can pick the best one, not by default. So uh, I'm all for doing the 2024 race out in Dolphin on District C. And then you can do the 2022 election in the Monta Vista area, and that should work out fine. But you are gonna have to wait, there's a transition. We're gonna have to wait a couple of years to have our election. And frankly, it's gonna take us that long to find somebody who can spare the tremendous amount of time that you each donate 
to the city of Monterey. I agree with Clyde. It's far more important than the money is the time that you have to give. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And next we have Robert Yoha. Go ahead, please, Robert. Am I on now? Yes, we yes you are, Robert. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make a comment about walking districts. I've walked my neighborhood numerous times for elections, for parking initiatives, and I've also tried to work with the neighborhoods uh, closer to the beach on neighborhood improvement programs. It took me a year to get support to change the fence around the most important park in our neighborhood. It's going to take us more than a year to find someone who has the time to become a city council member and then to build a coalition of people behind them to support them to vote them into office. We're going to need time. This redistricting process has gone really, really fast mm -hmm. and I'm surprised it's worked so well. Thank you everyone there in the council for you know, pushing this through so quickly. But once this falls into our neighborhood and I propose the community of interest called the Del Monte Boulevard, North Fremont Street uh, neighborhood community of interest. We have never ever gotten together to push a candidate before. I think waiting until, give us two years, we can find someone and support them. And as everyone knows, this is not an easy job. It takes 40 hours a week, every week out of the year. Um, it's not going to be easy to find a candidate that we can put together for our new district. So give us the time so we can do a good job. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Robert. And uh, no further hands raised at this time. All right, then I'll close that section of the public hearing, bring it back to the city council. Again, lots of great arguments uh, either way, both ways, always. You're going to make it tough again. <laughs> Who wants to start? Uh, Council Member Allen, would you start, please? Well, this one in some ways is, is more difficult than the other because it so obviously does impact, um, impact members of the council. And I'm just wondering if you know again we kind of laugh at the idea of a kind of random chance but that would really take it completely out of any kind of you know any kind of questions the public might have so i'm just kind of leaning towards um some sort of random chance determination of the order i don't find the 2024 presidential election persuasive as a reason to go one way or another. Um, I, I don't think, first of all, you're talking about in, I think the district that has the most Latinx voters is 18%. Whether you have, you know, 9%, which is half of them participating, or 75%, which is 13% of them, 14% maybe participating, that particular voter demographic is not going to be picking a, a candidate of their choice. We knew that all along, which was part of why I, I didn't really favor this. I didn't think this was going to be particularly effectual in in terms of the stated out out you know desires of LULAC. I, I don't think it's going to have that effect. So, but anyway, so for me to kind of use that then as a rationale to sort of you know sequence one district and over another i don't find it persuasive um but i i can't think of really any good reason to favor one sequence or another which is why i think kind of the most transparent and maybe fair way would be random chance thank you who else okay so i've got a question so I'm a little confused if it's a, if it's a random, so it's a random uh, straw vote of 22 versus 24 first. And Alan, um, Alan, you're up in 2024. Dan is up in 2024. Tyler and I are scheduled that if we chose to, that we would run for reelection in 2022. So what does that mean if 
the draw says 2024 goes first. Or, or, or let me say it a different way, that the first district goes is the new district we've formed. So two part question, do we have to do two? And what does that do leaving two council members that would, would have normally ran for a district? What do we do in 2022? So I've got to walk this through because it's, it's, I'm unclear about what happens if we just do one or do we have to do two? And what's the outcome for the 2022 council members? Well, Ed, I think I know, but I think it probably would be better if staff answered that, the yes. different scenarios, yeah. if we went. Yeah. Yeah. I think Nat can answer that. Part of it is the city charter. And, and part, of it's, part of it's it's late, so bear with me. I'd like to hear it again. Yeah, uh, go ahead, Nat. Yeah, so two districts have to be sequenced in 2022 and then two in 2024. I know, uh, you know, and, and Chrissy and Hans can, can chime in here as well in terms of uh, the process. But if, I understand it, if I understand it correctly, Ed, your question was also related to if, if two council members, can you repeat that other piece that you're asking? So if, 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 two, if the two elections are chosen to be not in districts that involved me or the other council member. So we, we would have to say which districts we want to be next first, okay? So we would declare it's A, B, C, or D. Yes. Okay. So if it's not those districts. So let's just say it's district B and C. So if it's okay. districts B and C that's yeah. scheduled for 2022, district C would have a, uh, not, no incumbent could run for office. Right, so brand new seat. Obviously, brand new seat. And then in District B, you have currently Councilmember Albert and Councilmember Hoffa, whose terms aren't up until 2024. So they could either decide to run for those, even though their terms aren't up for 2024, they would decide to run early in 2022 because that district, District B, is a four year term that would start from 2022 through 2026, right? And, and, and so Councilmember Albert and, 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 and Hoffa would have an opportunity to run for that District B seat early. Yeah. If one of either Councilmember Albert or Councilmember Hoffa would, would uh, especially run for office, then they would take over that New, they would represent District B, and the other person would represent the at-large seat. It would remain on the council only until their term expires in 2024. Okay, so if that was the first election, huh. then the two that held seats but expired in November 2022, they would not have a position to run for. Then the council would make appointments to the districts that need representation. Correct. Is that correct? Repeat that one more time. So how would you fill, how would you fill the two seats? And in this case, it would be um, District A and, and District D, correct? So District A is where Tyler is and District D is where I am. Would the council then be appointing representations to those two vacated council seats? Because we're done in 2022, November 2022. I can partially answer that. The city charter does not allow city council members to appoint to an empty seat. That charter amendment was made in late 80s, somewhere in the 90s, Chrissy might remember. Mm -hmm. And be previous to previously, the, uh, the the process was, if um, first of all, in in the early '80s, a council member could run from a safe seat <clears throat> for mayor, for example. So if they lost, <clears throat> they remained a council member. And so what happened? There was a scenario in 1983 
where uh, I won as mayor. So my council seat became vacant. And the council at that time was able to appoint that seat. Subsequent to that, a gentleman uh, got a um, initiative passed, which disallows that. So the council would not be able to appoint someone to the city council, it would go to election. So uh, if that's different because of districts, that's fine, but that's the way it is now. Okay. So, if I take yeah, go ahead. Pardon my interruption, but I, just, I think I need to just clarify a, a few, few things here. So the current city charter, section 2.5, mm -hmm. um, if there is a resignation, then a vacancy is filled um, by appointment by the city council. Um, so for example, if there's a district where two council members are residing, one is up in 2022 and one is up in 2024, and that is sequenced to go in 2022, the council member who, um, well, I guess we went through this, who um, is up in 2024 could choose to run mm -hmm. um, and may win or may not win. <laughs> um, it, the other point I wanted to make too is with respect to chance and um, the elections code really doesn't contemplate. I, I, I understand that maybe some other cities or entities have done this, but I think there could be an argument made that flipping a coin um, isn't giving special consideration to the um, purposes of the California Voting Rights Act, or it might be difficult to connect the dots on that and taking into account the preferences expressed by the members of those um, districts that are in the plan that has just been um, carried forward by the city council. So I think given the, the ability for that argument to be made that it might be best to follow the elections code um, 10010B and um, take those things into consideration with the sequencing as opposed to a coin toss. Thank you, Chrissy. Chrissy, so, if I could just clarify. So what you're saying is that the point that the mayor had just said about um, the council not being able to appoint somebody is inaccurate, right? So the council is able to appoint somebody to a, a vacated seat. Yes, let me just pull up the charter. It's charter section 2.5 um, and I'll read it to everyone. Um, I always love being corrected, by the way. I don't take it personally. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that we're all speaking the same language. Here. No, exactly, because I was I was there when that happened, that where it prevented a majority of the council from uh, appointing an empty seat. But I could be wrong. Well, and so with respect to the mayor position, um, there's there's a couple of different rules here. So let me just get to the right part of my page. I had it and it disappeared. Here we go. So the, the part you might be thinking of mayor is that if, if someone is gonna run for the office of mayor while they're holding a city council seat, um, they forfeit that seat. Uh, they don't get yes. the safe seat. That is, that's definitely correct. And then the charter section 2.5, let me get there. Uh, a vacancy in an elective office shall be filled by appointment by the council and such appointee to hold office until the next general municipal election and until a successor is elected and installed. Should oh, the people okay. be able to fill any such vacancy within 40 days, blah, blah, blah. And it goes, it goes through that whole um, exercise, but any vacancy and it goes on to say whether it's by recall, resignation, disability, physical disability, and so forth. So the city council does um, fill that vacancy by appointment. Can I Thank try you. to do one, one one more clarification, mm -hmm. which I think maybe answers Ed's question. So let's say hypothetically we choose District C, B, and C to run this year. So neither you or I would have a District C to run for. Let's say hypothetically, in your in the store in the scenario that you outlined, let's say Alan in uh, Dan decide to run, and I'm going to say Alan just because his name begins with an A. Um, let's say Alan wins, Dan would keep his seat because his seat isn't over until 2024. And then that would give the council an opportunity to appoint Alan's seat because, right, that left a vacancy. Is that accurate? No, because I, I, thought, I thought once I run or anybody runs, 
they're not running from a safe seat. So they give That's up only their if position. they're running for mayor. And so is, is that what you're saying? So if you are um, not, if your term isn't up until 2024, yeah, and you decide to run in 2022, and for council, lose, for council, for council, for council, and uh -huh. you lose, you lose your council bid for 2022. You still have your seat um, for 2024 because you're you serve at large until your term is up. You don't lose uh -huh. your term. Uh -huh. Now, if you are running for mayor, you do forfeit your seat under our current charter provisions. Okay, but that's that's one election right that was selected to be in 2022 right so if, if i'm understanding the hypothetical correctly there's yeah. two yeah. members one whose term expires in 22 one whose term expires in 24 and that one is going first in 22 and the member whose term expires in 24 runs and so does the one in 22 let's say they both run together <laughs> um and the one whose term does not expire if that person loses they still have their seat because they they serve at large um, until their term is up so in that scenario a and d um, at the beginning of the term um, then uh, did you did you mention that the the council would uh, appoint those two positions is that what you were saying tyler a and d no, I just those those two districts won't have a specific representative until 2024. Right. So I'm assuming that the council would have the opportunity to appoint somebody to finish out that term until 2024 when but we would you, select somebody for the district seat. You're talking about the at large. I'm sorry. Right. Yes. Yeah, yes. The at large. So the at, the at large seat. I, I I see. So they would we would be appointing for a two year term. Uh, the the council would be voting for or appointing for a two year term until 24, or would it be until 26? My assumption is it would be 24 until the district seat is up for election. No. no, so we don't add council seats. I'm sorry. So we still, our, our charter still sets the number of people that are on the council. So we're not going to have extra people. Um, so everyone who has a term does not forfeit their seat. And so you get to stay in your seat, even if you're not in a district. <laughs> even if there's too many of you in the same district, you're not going to lose your seat until 2024. Um, and there's not going to be appointments of people into vacant seats where they're, um, district isn't up until 2024. So it's the same number. I got a headache. <laughs> hey, can I ask a question? Um, yeah, can I see, can as help far us. as in the event that there, there was an appointment necessary, the appointment in 2022 for an at large seat could come from anywhere. It wouldn't have to come from a particular district is that correct? I think I need more facts before I can answer that. So I'm not sure when that scenario would come up. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm dodging that. When? Um, well, so the scenario would be, let's say, um, if if random chance determined that districts B and C were up for election in 22, and A and D in 24 then that would mean that um and dan and i would continue as at large members um but the there so so there would be an election in b mm -hmm. and there would be an election in c mm -hmm. um uh how do why would and we and, and d would vacate. i know i'm confused too <laughs> F, <laughs> no, that one to, to continue d would then vacate because the term ended yeah so there would be one vacancy that the council would have to either appoint or have a special election correct and the question is if they appointed would they be able to appoint since it's a technically an at-large seat it's not really d yet right it's an at-large seat would they be able to appoint from the city at large or for that to complete the last two years i i would prefer 
I, it, it doesn't sit well. This is the most co uncomfortable conversation we've had in eight years. <laughs> just want to let you know that. Uh, uh, I, I th hang on a second, uh, Hans. I just wanted to make one comment. I think appointments should be our last ditch effort because I mm -hmm. think that every council member should be elected by the residents of the city of Monterey. So if we can't work out where we're not electing two, mm -hmm. then, and we have to appoint one because of that scenario we just mentioned, that's the last ditch effort. Yeah. If we can't come to an agreement, then I think that's something that I, I would like to see. All right, we're gonna let our city manager enlighten us a little bit. Yeah, th thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so so no, uh, number one is the voters have spoken in 2020 and they have elected two council members for four years and the mayor at large for two years. Those two council members in 2020 were Dan Albert and Ellen Hoffer and uh, uh, the mayor was Clyde Robertson for two years. Now it's, it's crystal clear for me and very simplistic. You have two incumbents who are up for re-election if we would have at large if we would have right now at large elections. We don't have that, but you have a map right now where you can allow both incumbents to run in their respective districts, which would be A and D, and they they can put themselves in front of the voters. Uh, I, I, I think the, the, the ideas that the council is discussing right now could be disruptive to, to city business by, by going into the jungle of reappointments and mixing and matching. For me, uh, as, as, as simple as I think about this right now is, voters have given uh, uh, four years to council member Allen, council member Dan, and we can, con we can keep that promise. And you have two incumbents who are running for office, can run, could run for office right now, uh, Tyler in District A and uh, Councilmember uh, Ed in District Delta, and we have a mayor at large. I think uh, uh, what is two years? The city is 252 years old right now. Uh, there were arguments made with respect of grooming candidates, growing candidates, etc., creating coalitions. I think um, these were also ideas. I think council might want to discuss also as worthwhile and. Um, frankly uh two candidates are up for re-election or are there to two incumbents and it's it's not that difficult in my point of view and uh, that's just uh, from here i really don't like i need to share this with you as well randomness in this process because i think uh two council members have a strong vote from voters uh in uh, 2020 received and uh, i think that respect to those voters demands that that those terms should should be continued having said all that council it's it's my pleasure to not making the decision <laughs> thank you even, um, thank even, you Hans. Even, um, even a random system if that were the way we go nobody's term can be terminated through this process whoever is serving until 2022 gets to serve until 2022 mm -hmm. whoever's serving until 2024 gets to serve until 2024 Nothing that is happening with this mapping or districting is going to change that uh, or, or where you need to live or anything else. Okay, so I can throw a wrench in there. What if Alan and I run in B if that's the election and somebody else runs against us and they win? Then um, Alan, <laughs> right? No, so then if I'm understanding the sequencing right, both of you. We, we uh, stay in. We stay in. Both of you stay in as large, and then you you have B, but then you have to wait two years for the new person to take over because they ran for a district. <laughs> so uh, that's why. I mean, that's so, why that's I, a good one. I have to uh, think about that one. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So I, I I think I think our city manager makes sense to me. To be honest with you. Yeah. Can Can, can I? Can I just weigh in? And I know it's late and this is hard. Um, I, I think this is an opportunity where it's one of those things where flipping a coin or leaving it on chance or just saying we can't make a decision doesn't feel right to me. And I think Hans has said it and I think Danny has said it. Um, it it's a time for leadership of deciding which two we think should go first. 
uh, the 2022 election, the 2024 election. To me, it makes sense to, you know, let the 2024, it's the new district. Um, it seems like the sequencing is we're going to have one district that will be a new district and we'll have another district that will be um, potentially two people up for re-election uh, and other candidates. And it's going to be whoever the voters decide to represent the new district and the current council members that will now then be in a district. But it just seems like the sequencing should be 2022 first and then 2024 when it comes uh, for the new districts and those that are holding on to that with four year elections, uh, they've got time, the voters have elected them, let them serve that out. And so sequencing for me, it seems like it should be 2022 first and then 2024. It le it's the so, less, less complicated. So I, um, I went into our last council meeting thinking that we should create an opportunity for the less affluent, uh, the two less affluent districts be ran first. So that way that we give them an opportunity. But one thing that um, the demographer Paul um, mentioned at the last council meeting was this whole methodology around um, the presidential cycle. And so when that was brought up, I thought it was a really good point. And I disagree with um, the comment that Esther was making earlier, just in that, yes, during presidential cycles, we can see increases in voter participation across all groups, but I bet we can imagine that homeowners are more likely to vote in midterm elections in comparison to presidential cycles. So what we can expect an increase in, a dramatic increase in is voter, uh, renters voting in a, 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 a greater number um, uh, than non-presidential cycles. So my assumption is that my hope would be that we um, allow renters, because I'm going on this path of trying to focus on renters for us and giving them the greatest opportunity. So for me, I think that's choosing the larger rental districts and allowing them to be ran in 2024. And we choose more two affluent districts to be ran in 2022 this year, if that makes sense. So if I'm looking at the map, that would be District B and D. Uh, no, it'd be A, A and D, wouldn't it? A and D, no. Mm, let me see, am I reading this correctly? Owner occupied is higher in B and D on the dolphin map. So you're, you're saying one of the ones that would have cycled for 2024, actually you would want to do it early. Well, we're, I think we're deciding. I don't think there's any kind of rule in regards to specifically how we do this, but, but if you were to make the assumption that we just choose your and my district, then yes, I would say we move one of the other ones earlier to stick with the methodology of allowing the two less affluent districts be ran in the presidential cycle. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a motion to run districts B and D in 22 and A and C in 2024. All right, we have a motion. Is there a second? Uh, I'll second that. Hmm. Okay. So, can I, well, I can't point it out. I'll just ask the question. If, if B were run two years early, that would be for the district of B. Mm -hmm. However, we have two council members that currently have at-large elections, and they are good until 2024. Mm -hmm. So how would that play out? Because if we had a brand new election for District B, that's both Alan and Dan 
at large, they would then still be there for two more years. To me, that just seems like it's confusing to the community. And then, so we would have a newly elected, we'd have two carryovers for two more years. And then we would have a brand new council member from C, correct? And then District A would be vacated and we'd still have to make an appointment. So it seems like that just creates more confusion and trying to fill the vacancies. Yes, Councilmember Allen. Yeah, so I seconded this for the purposes of discussion and to get something on the table. Yes. Um, but I'll be honest, I'm tired. Uh, it, just to clarify, this decision must be made tonight. Is that correct? We can't do this in two, this second part of the decision in two weeks. Matt, can you answer can that? clarify that. Can answer that. Um, the ordinance that will go before you on February 1st needs to have uh, sequencing listed in, in the ordinance, but uh, council has an opportunity to make a change to that only one more time in two weeks. So um, one option is for us to bring forth a proposal or staff recommendation for you uh, to consider, and then if you'd like to make that change, you can do so. Okay. Okay. I, in, in some ways, I'm I'm kind of yeah, Chrissy. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I I'm sorry to interrupt, but I would prefer that it really not be a staff recommendation because the, the no. election code does require it to be um, based on the city council's um, yep. weighing of these factors. Um, yep. You could have a staff analysis, but not a recommendation. Mayor, I, I'd like to make a subsequent uh, a motion that uh, we uh, run A and D in 2022 and B and C in 2024. Uh, and I'll second that. Okay. Well, what I was going to say was I, I I don't really like the idea of B going in 2022, so I wasn't crazy about Tyler's motion as I began thinking about it. Mm -hmm. The main reason being you would actually have three representatives from B between 22 and 24, which doesn't seem to really be the gist of what we're trying to accomplish. Right. On the other hand, I'm not really crazy about this motion either um, because <laughs> I think it doesn't do what Tyler, I think, wanted to do, which was try to move forward with. Um, representation for in those areas that are least represented that would be area that would be districts a and c in my view a and c should be um sequenced first in 20 or in 20 they should be in i see it's a mess so, I, I don't know so i it's think i think you're gonna have I, I think the way I, I the reason i came up with a and b a and d is we don't have enough districts <laughs> to vote on or, or to put in the sequence. I mean, if we had five districts, we could probably do that, but we don't, we have four. So one district, which is the, the, the highest underrepresented, that's would be C and that would go in 24. And then, I, and unfortunately we just have to make a decision. We have to make a choice and C would, to me would, would go in 22. Yeah. Um, so the, tonight would be the recommendation that we give staff to bring us back the first reading. And at that time, that, that would be in two weeks, right? At yes. the next council meeting. So it seems like if we go with, I know there's two motions, but um, I seconded uh, Mr. Alberts. But if we went with that one, we would have an opportunity to come back and maybe pick this up with a little more clarity and it won't be 10 o'clock and maybe we can work through this to get to a second reading 10 30. yeah 10 30. thank you yeah, and my, my thought looking at this is i understand that you want to have a higher turnout among the uh, people that possibly would be disenfranchised but on the other hand do we want a city council appointing someone to uh, District A? That's what we would be doing. So we would have a council appoint 
New Monterey and half of uh, Old Town, shouldn't that person be elected? That would be, they would have their election in 2024. Right, but then someone would be appointed by the city council for two years. No, the, 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 two, the two seats that would be ran are in districts B and D. But, so but which would would have, but, but again, but, but lose, again, though, but, but, but again, Obama, Williamson, you would lose your seat. But but again, it's not though, about, I'm 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 not trying to make this about me. So. I know. I just wanted to to clarify that. But uh, but again, I though, I, I think we have to think of something else, and that is that if we do run B, um, either myself or Alan may run for B, and if we win or if we lose or whatever. Um, then you're going to be appointing somebody. Right. So be I think we're making somebody this too much about large. And the reason I, I pick, this... hang on a second. Sorry, sorry, go ahead, Dan. And the reason that I, I, I chose this is because this guarantees that our, our council members will be elected and not appointed. Right. And, and, and I think, I, well, I can think I can honestly say that if, if B is open, then, you know, somebody, from this council will probably run. <laughs> I, I, I just my, want my to, I just want to say that. <laughs> my, my only point is that I don't think we should be making this about ourselves. Just my opinion. I like I I I understand what there could be some confusingness that comes out of this. This whole process is confusing. I'm if you all noticed the participation in the call, we've lost over half of the people that were attending the meeting because I think we're just losing them. And I I'm think not, as this as this process rolls out with us transitioning to districts, it's going to continue to be messy and confusing, and it's going to be a whole bunch of things. What I think we shouldn't do is make it about us that are on the council. And actually, one thing that I recommend, and I'm not sure if it could be part of a motion, but I encourage us to just choose, like, for future uh, redistricting efforts in the city of Monterey, that we have an independent commission do this. So that it's separate from the council, and we can get rid of the the, the politics that are um, likely to be involved with this experience. So my only point is, what I was putting forward in my original motion was completely removed from us as current council members in trying to find some logic around how we should be placing um, and choosing when which districts go when. And so for me, it's either. We create an opportunity now for maybe the more underrepresented districts to have a representative now in 2022, or we let them do it in 2024 and kind of go with what the demographer is saying, which could be that we can give them a greater opportunity to get their person selected. So I think there's a trade-off because part of me wants to be able to give them that opportunity now. But on the other side, I feel like giving them the greatest opportunity and holding off on two years gives them that greater voter turnout. So to me, it's either A and C, I'm sorry, yeah, A and C or, or B and D. I don't see why you would say C and then we just have to guess what the other one. I mean, the numbers kind of show kind of where the underrepresentation is at. So I think we should just kind of stay in sync with kind of that methodology. Tyler, I, I wasn't, please don't, don't make it think like I was thinking of myself when I came to uh, about this. What I'm talking about is I just don't, I, I don't think it's good for the city to have an appointed council member. And if we have the opportunity to elect our council members, then I think that is a better route to go. That, that was my only concern. And, but, but what I'm saying is, is that we're making assumptions about people running, for, like, one of I us as current, as current incumbents running for office and how that might impact, right? Yes. And, and again, it's going to be messy regardless. So yes. I think making an assumption about who's going to run where, I think that doesn't have anything, that should not influence kind of the logic that we're using in regards to which two districts we're going to run first. No. I think that the process will play out the way that it will. And then if anything, it will only be two years before we go to the full districts. Okay, so we have a substitute motion, which is A and D. Then the original motion, Clementine, what was the original motion, please? The original motion was B and D in 2022 and A and C in 2024. Okay. 
Got it. Well, I think uh, 2022, I think Ed's suggestion is let's pick one. We can change it in two weeks if we want. <laughs> <laughs> or if there's, if it's pretty clear that we're not split on it, then we, we can decide tonight. So if you don't mind, I think we should do that. Again, with the idea is the real big decision, final decision is in two weeks. Does that make sense? If we go ahead and start with the substitute motion. All right, uh, Clementine, read the substitute motion, please, again. Um, yes, the substitute motion was that the um, 2022 election would have A and D districts, and in 2024, the B and C district seats would be up. All right, and anything else? Roll call, please. Councilmember Albert? Yes. Councilmember Williamson? No. Councilmember Hoffa? Uh, no. Councilmember mm -hmm. Smith? Yes. And Mayor Roberson? Yes. Again, we'll discuss it more and we can think about it. All the excellent arguments that are being made. Okay, so, wow. <laughs> Whoever laid this system out 252 years ago. Oh, I know. Okay. Let's take a quick look at the agenda. Oh, we finished that one up. That was easy peasy. And not, uh, okay. Do we need a motion to continue beyond the 10? I can't remember. I think at one time it was 1030, maybe it's 11 now. Well, right now we have uh, continued public comments, council comments, city manager reports. And so I would think, uh, Chrissy, uh, I, I think the fact that continued public comments is on the uh, agenda, are we required to do that or can we adjourn since it's uh, past 1030? I would recommend that we do um, continue public comment. Yeah, then if the council doesn't mind, we'll pass on council comments and city manager reports. Well, let's do continue public comments and see if there are any. Are there any? Uh, public comments, not agenda items. If you spoke earlier, then you had your chance. Is there anyone who wanted to talk to that the council will let anything not on the agenda? I see three hands raised at this moment, uh, Mr. Mayor. Okay, well, let's go then. All right, uh, now we've got a fourth. Okay, Richard Russello. Good evening again. I'll make it very short. Speaking as the president of the Casanova Oakville Neighborhood Association, I wanted to express our deep appreciation for the mayor, the council, the city manager, and special attention to Christine Davi, our city attorney. Uh, you were very successful in a lawsuit, a sequel lawsuit against the airport district, and you just won. And that's going to make a tremendous difference in the history of our neighborhood. Uh, we were looking at traffic doubling or tripling from the airport north side. And thanks to this council, you protected this neighborhood, you stopped it. And Christine did such a great job at the, in the courtroom that the judge was extremely explicit in his criticism of the airport district's handling of the CEQA process. So I want to say job well done. We really appreciate it. You changed the history of our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. It's always good to hear appreciation where it is due. Next, Esther Malkin. Hello again, I'll make this quick also. I just want to bring to your attention that in my neighborhood, we have had four sewage backups in four homes, not including our streets that had the backup and literally sewage was everywhere. People's homes were damaged indoors from the sewage backup. So I think that it's important that we start paying a little bit of more attention to um, clarifying what the city's role is when it comes to sewer lines and what the homeowners 
um, have to do with these black flow valves because many of them don't know about that. And our neighborhood is made up of predominantly older homes. The, the newer homes are the ones that have that installed. But I'd like you to think about 1030 at night having your house flooded with sewage for a couple of hours. And that's what happened to two neighbors on English last year. We've had two neighbors on Casanova have it since then. So hopefully, you know, somebody in public works can pay a little bit of attention to that because I guarantee you it's not fun, regardless of what neighborhood you live in, but there's less chance of it happening in, in other neighborhoods than ours. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, next, let's hear from Robert Yola. Uh, one last item, if I could make uh, a suggestion. Um, this city council has just done something momentous with the charter for the citizens of Monterey. Um, would it be possible to put a bronze plaque with your names in front of <laughs> City Hall celebrating this? That's my question and suggestion. And thank you all so much for all your hard work on this. Uh, this has probably been the most difficult, most challenging and most rewarding thing that you've done. And thank you. Thank you, Robert. We very much appreciate that. A brass plaque is really appropriate. Okay, <laughs> we'll start taking donations. <laughs> I'll donate. Oh, you're great. <laughs> I'll walk my neighborhood for this. Thank you, Robert. And Mike Brassfield. I just wanted to echo Richard's comments about the taking on the airport. Over the years, they have had kind of an attitude that they really can't, we can't really do much for what they say. So we really support the efforts of the city to show them that not they could just can't dance around a SECO report and make it last. Um, SECO works both ways. <laughs> and I do appreciate the city's, and that's not just one or two people, but that's council and staff. We do appreciate all the hard work done by everyone in the city in this support effort. And regarding Esther's comment, having gone through similar episode, the city cannot stop all sewage uh, backups, no matter what their maintenance schedule is. It comes down to a little bit of personal responsibility because I had to go through it. So it's not, I don't want to cast blame on city work staff in, in this case, but uh, I appreciate all the efforts of the city. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Mike. We appreciate that. And Mayor, there are no further hands raised. All right, so we'll close public comments, council comments. Look like we have anything left. <laughs> Mayor, Mayor, I've got one, one tiny one I wanna try okay. and race through it real quick. Last Wednesday night, uh, AMBAG um, went through a very arduous process. It's actually taken about a year. Uh, the vote came down to uh, picking a model of uh, what would give us an essential arena number that um, is extremely high. So if anybody has any questions on the council or the public and they, they wanna reach out and contact me, um, my email is smith at monterey.org i would love to hear from you i took a no vote on the model as a protest vote because of the process that the housing and community development is forcing us to go through uh, but i'm in i'm in favor of trying to find ways that we get more housing uh, but the rena process was very very complicated with lots more numbers and math and uh, i voted no for option z uh, because it left the city of monterey with an untenable number uh, with the likelihood that the state may become very punitive on the arena numbers. So if any of you have any questions, uh, feel free to give me a call and I can explain 
a little bit more and then provide you with some material as, as well. Thank you, Ed. Anyone else? Okay, then the uh, city manager reports. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, good work tonight. Yeah, it was, it was, it was. Is that it? Yep. Okay, thanks. And I, I would absolutely agree. And as I always say, and I mean it, it's um, there's such a caring city that we all love and public comments, the great staff work that got complimented tonight. And uh, once again, my colleagues uh, on the council always provide a stimulating evening, which enables all of us to, to grow and, and stretch. So I appreciate all of you and we're adjourned. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. And sleep well. Good night. Good night. <laughs>